Hello, everybody. Um, Hello. It's it's been two months, uh, three ish or... months, which is three better months. better than your promised six months from our last talk. You're so you're well, so mean, Joe. Three months is about one week in Berserk time. So you know, like, <sighs> what does that mean? <laughs> it means it's like most manga on our weekly schedule, but Berserk is on like a six month schedule. Yeah. I was about to say, um, they, uh, they're still releasing Berserk chapters about once every six months, which means they're keeping Mira's legacy alive. That is the most yeah. shocking part, when I found out that you guys are still on hiatus hell, despite the handing of the reins to... I uh, thought it would get better. Yeah. I wonder if it's a lot of... It, it might, what if it literally just takes that long to fucking draw all this shit? Because... I can see it. See, I had, I had that thought, but here's the thing. What's his name? Boichi yeah. does really good art, and he does it way faster. I don't know if it's better art. That's debatable. Sometimes it is better, but he does it way faster. That's not debatable. Joe, Dan and Dan exists on a weekly schedule. That, all things are possible. <laughs> it's, uh, that true. But that man's cracked, so that's a different Yeah, that story. man is crazy, Bradley. There's so many panels we show. Anyways, oh God. Um, so... Our thesis statement here is we're going to go through most of the rest of the Golden Age arc. Now, we're going to get to, like, just the beginning as things are heating up at the, like, at the eclipse, the advent. Um, and I was talking to them about this today, like, just beforehand. But part of the reason why is that when I was going through this, I ran out of sticky notes. Like, I just, I just, I just ran out. So I, I couldn't, I had to stop physically taking notes. But the other one was, like, there was an entire section of this whole story that I completely forgot about. <laughs> so Now, Joe, I'm telling yeah. you to go restock on Sticky Notes as an order, because if you don't, that's more incentive for you not to fucking yeah. do your notes, and then we have to wait six months. So I'm, I'm well, let me hard-ass pressure you into buying some Sticky Notes for the greater good. Yeah. I will. I will go pick some up as soon as it's not freezing over here. <laughs> By the way, I have to turn off my little space heater for this recording, so I'm, I'm my balls are freezing for okay. for berserk. Oh, it's so bad. So it's will, so cold. We will charge forward. Um, we were we're starting where we picked off, maybe a little bit, a few pages beforehand, but we're starting off in, um, the guts and Griffith. I was about to say guts and berserk. The guts and Griffith rematch. Yes. Um, so I number one. I just I love this spread here of the two of them just facing off again. Yeah. Oh, it's it, it is it, it's like a top ten iconic manga panel for me. I just yeah. not just in the series. Mm -hmm. Um, there was even a guy on the Berserk subreddit who got that panel tattooed with Griffith above one nipple and guts above the other nipple. It, it was very what? very great. <laughs> That's a, Berserk uh, fans, man. <laughs> That's fucking never. Um. Uh, I'm also going to just start off, us off at the top of the hour here saying that uh, we're going to be talking about sex a lot. And there's not a lot of images I'm going to be able to show during video. Well, your, I mean, your recording doesn't make it onto the video unless you want it to this time. Uh, I, 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 no. <laughs> it's mostly good for our visual references. Yeah, yeah. But we're, we're, just, we're just, you know, there's going to be a lot of talk about sex and what it means within the stories. I think. Um, but I think the main portion part of this whole, like, section here is how everyone just feels the change of the winds in this moment. Like, with the exception of, I think, Guts and Griffith, um, like, I think regardless of what happened here, people realize that things are going to change within the Band of Hawk. And this was like a big watershed moment for what, is, what comes after. Are you uh, saying that, like, to some degree, they understand it better than the two participants even do? Because, like, yes. th they have their relationship or, like, their own feelings. They're, they can't look objectively at, like, oh, they just changed the whole dynamic. Yes. It's like, even if, like, Guts lost and had been a hawk, that was going to affect Guts in some way that would change the dynamic of the relationship entirely as well. Like, I think if, like, the, there was a what-if scenario of, of Guts losing this fight, it, it would still affect the dynamic of the entire band, yes. regardless. Um, that being said, I I really like that, like, Casca... Uh, no, sorry, there's this line that Judo says... Uh, or is, it's right here. Uh, like, where she is... Where he is, like, 
uh, seeing the change that's happening not only in Guts and Griffith, but in like Casca. Uh, because Cask, because Jado is seeing that like Casca's like whole like connection to Griffith is changing dynamically, and she's now moving a little bit more towards Gus, guts romantically. Um, so I I think it's just like you can see in the wind, and I think what's also really cool about this whole segment is that comparatively to the first match where there was a bunch of blows being swung, it just took one strike for Guts to take down like Griffith in this fight. And here's the thing, yeah. I'm just gonna say it. In their first duel, Guts just came out of a full battle, and then he fought some of the Band of the Hawk, and then I also think he got shot with a crossbow, and then he fought Griffith, so I don't even know if he was at, like, max capacity in that first duel. Interesting to say, like, there's the idea, it's like, I could have always beat you, like, you were never that superior to me, maybe. Yeah, and you know, this particular duel that we're talking about right here, it, it's, it's interesting for the reasons Joe mentioned it, this changes the whole dynamic of the Band of the Hawk because Griffith has always been untouchable. And this, sure, this is not him losing in a battle. This mm -hmm. doesn't make people lose faith in the dream, but someone beat Griffith. Yeah. Th that's got to count for something. Yeah, yeah. that's unheard of. I think also what's really interesting here, um, because a big a big character moment for Griffith is realizing how much, of a, how much Gus is is there's this page here where Griffith is like going through the different ways he could take down Guts and he's like holding himself back. Like he doesn't want to hurt Guts, he just wants to beat him. Whereas I think he didn't, like comparatively in the first fight, like there was no like thought bubble about that. Griffith was just going to fight Guts and if he ended up killing him, it's whatever. Like you can, that's just another way of showing like how much of like affect guts as of in Griffith's Griffith where it's like I am now actively trying to do as little harm as I can possibly for you whereas I don't know if guts is thinking the same thing or guts is has more emotional control over the fact that like I know I need to beat you so here's why I need to do it like it's it's I think an interesting thing yeah. to think about I like that even better as a read for why this duel went differently um because like you said the, the first time they dueled there's no history between them you know, obviously Griffith wanted Guts to join them because he's like, this guy's strong as fuck. But whether he lives or dies probably didn't make that much of a difference in the first duel. Mm -hmm. We know that Guts has affected Griffith in ways that no other partner or friend ever has. And that's probably why this duel went the way it did. Mm -hmm. I, uh... So... So they have the fight, and it's one swing, Guts cuts the sword in half, and Guts just walks away. Like, he he doesn't, he, he's already said his goodbyes, he just starts walking in the distance. And the final, like, page of the section is, um, Guts is mentioning that this is just a stumbling on a rock on the roadside, it's a petty small thing. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, the place you want to go is a far, is further, is a further distance off. Like, in the grand scheme of things, in Guts' head for Griffith, this is nothing like you're losing one person. You still have a, a journey to go to get to where you're going. So you have plenty of time to make up what you've stumbled here. Christ. Little did he know. Yeah. But the, just the irony in that thought is, is just, I think incredible. And like how like not wrong guts is like, this should not be a huge, like in, in the, in the grand logistics of running an army, it should not be that big of a, a toll in, like, what Griffith is going for, especially after everything they've done, right? Like, Griffith is, like, two or three sets of really accomplishing what he needs to do. It'll take a while, but he's almost there, right? And that's so, the thing, is yeah. there's, there's the ambition with Griffith. At this point, I think they're pretty much already nobles. Yes, they, they, they are. They, they could probably coast for the rest of their lives, but mm -hmm. Griffith is not going to stop until he gets what he wants. Yeah, the price of ambition. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I uh, I think that fight's great. Um, and I, I love how it's three chapters, I guess, technically. Um, but it's so simple, but, like, you, you definitely feel the way. I think it's Mira, correct? I'm not wrong there in the author's name. It's Mira right. that... Yes. Okay. Kentaro Mira. Mira great, Come on. Yes. Mira does a great job of like showcasing that like just like internal struggle that we're having here. But whereas previously we kind of were looking more on the gut side, we could 
the band of Hawk side and Griffith side how that affected. Like Casca's even calling out to him, and and like you see his footprints in the snow, and he wanders off in the distance. Um, it's a good imagery. Uh, that ends volume eight officially, and we move on to volume nine, which is uh, the worst things in the world. Um, is that all in volume off, nine? Yeah, this oh, is good. only volume nine. Oh goodness! Uh, first off, we don't talk about cover pages a lot in Berserk because they don't generally happen, but I think this cover page is rad. Joe uh, is referring to Chapter 37's uh, sc- Behalet in the Skull cover page. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks uh, pretty sick. You know, I, I thought that thing is sick. It looks like it should be on like a band album cover kind of De- thing. Definitely. Looks I, like it should yeah. be on a tattoo on my forehead. Yeah. Oh, God, Bradley. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> um. So, I believe this chapter is when we're introduced... Is it we're introduced here? No. Yes, it is. This is where we're introduced to everyone's favorite boy, uh, Skeleton Knight, Skull Knight. Is this the first appearance? This is his first appearance. Let's go. For real? Uh-huh. I So, again, I'm still in the conviction arc because I stopped reading until we catch up. <laughs> so Joe's yeah. holding me hostage. I still don't see the hype between Skull Knight despite him looking badass. So I'm like very interested in this character because I know everybody loves this guy. You... Haven't gotten to the part where they do a little bit more of that, like, yeah, one piece teasing yes, for te- him. Tease me, please. Get the yeah. drip, drip feed of lore, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's also some other stuff that we'll talk about that comes up later that I think for, um, which will be fun. To, a little bit of theory crafting to do there because it it talks about things that I don't really know of. Fine. Um, but. I really like Skull Knight. Is it Skull Knight or is it Skeleton Knight? What do people call him? I it, don't like. I go back. And I forth. thought it was Skull Knight. I think it is just Skull Knight. Okay. Are we? The, is, is that a Yu-Gi-Oh monster? Are we getting confused? That's no. Summon Skull. Okay. Oh, yeah. His his name is Summon Skull. That's right. I think we're good. I'm I'm sure there's a Skull Knight though. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's like Gaia plus Summon Skull is Skull Knight or something <laughs> like. That. Dude, yeah. you you uh, you're probably a hundred percent right and. I, I um, can verify. But I do like... I, I like Skull Knight's design. I think he's very cool. And I think, like... I think Muir does a... Muir does some really interesting things here with this character. I I, I want to... I'll talk about them later when they... There's just this air of mystery <laughs> in, like, how he relates to the Behelets and the God Hand that that's just, like, what are you doing here? Because he's very otherworldly, but he doesn't have the same agenda as all the other otherworldly things we've met. Um, so we go. No. Okay. Um, I think we are just some really good teasing with Skull Knight. And like, it kind of like, I don't know, man. It just does something for me. It, <laughs> it just, it's like, I think he does some really cool stuff with like, the obscuration of details. It's very, it feels very like void century with one piece of like things might not be what we seem kind of a scenario. Yeah. Um, a, a mystery in other words. He's, he's a mysterious yeah. figure with a cool design in a story that has been primarily knights like human opponents aside from like the zods yeah, yeah, of the it's, world it's been pretty grounded uh i was about to say grounded fantasy not even really fantasy up to that point aside from zod yeah, yeah. now i do want to file one complaint here oh shit i don't like how in the animated features they have them all metal he needs to be bone colored like that's but that's just my stupid warhammer brain like that's what that should be. But like I feel like there's gotta be something in lores about metal skeletons because Mother of Learning also has a metal skeleton. So yeah. I feel like I feel like that we're we're just missing some context there. And in commenters below, if you know where all these metal skeletons are coming from, do let us say, know. There's definitely yeah. plural metal skeletons in fiction. So I wonder if that's like a historical thing. But here's the thing. That draw you guys were talking about with the Skull Knight, it's kind of what I've been waiting for since the beginning of the Golden Age. Because at the end of the Black Swordsman arc, yeah. you you run into these mysterious figures that Guts clearly has history with, but we don't know what that is. And then we immediately jump way back to the beginning of the Golden Age. And when that happens, obviously you're like, okay, 
I want to know how we got to that point. Yeah. And when this mysterious, demonic-looking figure comes forward and starts spewing stuff that you don't know but is obviously foreshadowing, you're like, okay, this is it. We just left the Band of the Hawk. Mr. Foreshadowing Guy is saying stuff. Like, it's happening. And I, I think I've talked about before how, like, that was my one thing I didn't like about Golden Age. It's just the fact that, like, I'm already kind of adverse to, like, the whole night setting and, like, just mm -hmm. fantasy, like... If we're going fantasy, I want there to be a lot of uh, the fantastical elements. So that was, like, the beginning. Like, the storytelling is great, but I was like, it, it is just dudes with weapons. And, like, that's not my aesthetic. My aesthetic. I need some magic in there. I'm like, oh, we're getting there. We're getting back yeah, there, rather. The setting is... It's... It, Berserk is so weird. Because it's like, we're going to start off with this high, gritty fantasy shit people are turning to snake and slug monsters <laughs> yeah and there's and there's fairies and there's skeletons and like there's ghosts and this person's being haunted and they're like all right we're gonna run back the clock and none of that shit is happening anymore like no one even believes that it should happen <laughs> like it's like what <laughs> i was about to like, say like i've played the berserk muso on my playstation yeah. and a lot of the golden age battles are the battles that you just kind of have to get through like, once you start getting to, like, the more fantastical shit, you're like, yeah. this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. And, like, okay, remind me how it goes. Like, d does the Eclipse unleash more monsters into the world? Or is it just yeah. a natural de degradation of the world where, like, just over time? It's it's a... We'll get there, but essentially, we'll get there. it's a monumental event where, like, the two worlds kind of cross over the train epicenter where like things can start like coming in of like the realms well i guess that's cool uh, like i didn't pick up on my first read i remember like oh this implies that there will be like a big event where monsters start showing up again like i guess by the time i was deep into the golden age arc i kind of forgot how some of it started yeah that's interesting. i think mira also is maybe a little bit flying the sea of its fans but also just kind of like figuring things out like how to get there at this point so there's not so much of a, that foreshadowing, unless I've missed something important, Bradley. He might have been trying to figure out how to tie that bow. But um, yeah. I, I do think the story eventually makes it very clear how and yes. why more monsters make it into the world. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, uh, what what great author isn't flying by the seat of their pants at least sometimes, you know? Like, that's yeah. common. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I think the way, like, it, it, it turns out is really good. Um, but anyways, so the, going back to Skull Knight, everyone's favorite character... Um, he shows up and he starts spouting shit that Zod was saying, which is automatically a red flag, right? Like, you're just like, this guy's fucking talking about some whack ass event that's gonna happen <laughs> and God isn't gonna survive. Except, Skull is Knight is not telling him he's not going to survive. He says he's going to struggle, which I think is really interesting. It's kind of the first key of going, like, hold up, this dude. Shows up, crazy as fuck, talking about this in the world stuff, but is telling Gus that he will live through it. And that's very different than what we've been told before. Um, and we know that he does because we've seen the Black Swordsman arc or read it. But, uh, but like this, but this is, he's saying the same stuff that Zod did, but is not saying that he's going to die, but instead you're going to move forward from. Which I think is very interesting. Do you suppose, like, can you pinpoint something where, like, destiny changed or why they would have different takes on what would happen with Guts? I can't do that now within this arc, I okay. think. Fair. I would have to go through other arcs. Um, I was just curious because I certainly don't remember, like, the implication of, like, a in inflection point. The the only thing that we have kind of, like, a, a maybe, like, a previous thought about is that Guts being born A and then Guts getting running away from his camp as a kid and then like finding the drive like he struggling and, and having to get past like one terrible event of his life after another right like that's the only kind of thing we have but it's not like a concrete detail of the world or his destiny it's more of just like a character trait of Guts mm -hmm. that makes sense alright anyways um, Griffith goes visits the princess in her room um and this is kind of the event that leads to the downfall of griffith in the band of hawk 
And uh, by leads, I mean causes. Uh, so Griffith comes and visits the princess in her room and kind of forces himself upon her. Um, there's a... I'm trying to, like, think, like, how to properly, like, describe the irony of this because very much like the princess um the princess does want griffith and likes griffith and we know this like it's pretty obvious but now this is a much more forceful kind of affair of like i'm going to come and take you basically yeah um, he's clearly frustrated at the at the loss of guts i mean he's thinking of guts a lot during the scene which you know yeah. <laughs> the subtext thinking about someone else in the bedroom uh but I, uh, I think one of the things that popped out to me here, and like, there's, there's going to be another sex scene later, um, very long time later. But like, this scene in particular felt very pornographic to me. Um, yeah, this that... is like the most, uh, I don't know, choreography you could say. Choreographed. Yeah. <laughs> Choreographed. Yeah. There's the angles that you might see in other sorts of media. Yeah, like, and it's and it's very much about like the lustful endeavor and more of like the the conquest of like compared to what we'll see later with guts and Casca. So it's it's very sexual and very lustful. It's not romantic. It like you get that feeling. she is being used in this moment, um, and and you get like Casca uh, thinking about it. So we were talking like the last thing we talked about uh, on our last video was this twisted love triangle and how it is pretty much mm -hmm. multi-sided everyone's kind of lusting for everyone in this triangle and yeah. um it's just interesting that later on we'll talk about guts and casca while griffith yeah. is going through it to say the least so <laughs> yeah. yeah it's um so like my media thought there is like it, and it's kind of very obvious where it's like it's Griffith is upset that he doesn't get to control guts or guts has left him and i think that opens up a really interesting like character dynamic for griffith where like a kind of flaw for him is that he likes being of the people around him and having that sense of like ownership of them yeah. right and and i think that's this is like the very first clear sign of that how like the negatively affecting everyone else with him whereas previously he was that was being funneled to like protect them in some way like we're going to kill off the queen and her conspirators because she's trying to get rid of us or like we need to like make sure that this person gets assassinated because they're trying to like take us down yada yada like it's being channeled in a way that helps the majority of his friends rather than hinders them whereas now this is a frustration to take out it ends up hurting the entirety of the band of hawk mm -hmm. um it, so, he let emotion take over, and then like immediately, right. it's the downfall of the entire empire, which is interesting. It it highlights how he might have been on like a razor wire a lot of this time, where it, like he, he a lot of, he could have made a lot of emotional mishaps, but he's been playing it so well up until this point, and he just fumbled the ball. <laughs> um, the ball is an understatement, I would say. <laughs> oh. Um, so Griffith tries to escape. Uh, he merely gets caught because uh, we have the uh, the the handmaiden like peeks in on the uh, uh, on the scene. Peeks in on that yeah. snitch. I mean, <laughs> isn't this girl like fifteen as well? So like, it's just not yeah. good optics. She's very good. Um, what? she's very good. She's very young. Jesus Christ. Uh, so. Uh. Goodness. Where, where do we go from here? Griffith gets captured. Um, he gets tormented and tortured. I think it's really weird um, that they let him keep the behelet. Um, I, I know that's that's like a weird like it small is, thing. It is convenient. We'll we'll have to we'll have to at least say that. <laughs> yeah, like he keeps his pants on. They strip him of everything else. It's like, oh, he can keep his little weird fucking necklace thing that he's got there. He can keep his little toy. Yeah. Um, it's a magic tool for later. Yeah, it is. <laughs> remember, remember his magic toy. We get introduced to this fucking goblin of a character, the torturer. Christ. Um, this guy. Jeez, I forgot dude, this guy's I have design. About that, dude. <laughs> no. <laughs> this, 
this guy you this guy you talk about like us starting to get back into that like black swordsman arc where we see like a bunch of weird shit and just weird people this guy is like real definite I'm like oh we're getting back into these designs he's one of the most demonic yeah. things we've seen i think the first he panel i saw that dude i was like i can't wait for him to get killed oh man it's one of my favorites um he has a stupid list um as well but he takes the behillet uh eventually and it's like kind of the one that casts them casts it to the side and like throws it away um and then we get this very weird scene of uh, this the dad awful. like sexually harassing his daughter and i really don't know what to make of this scene i'm gonna be real honest with y'all i mean uh, we've talked a lot about just there being every character getting raped or assaulted in some way and it's just like i yeah. think mira is still kind of in in that mindset where like it all has to come down to that power dynamic because like it, it's yeah. it's a little bit his crutch in this arc i will say but Here's that's a hot thing. take i know i think it yeah. is i think the, the key words are power dynamic here's yeah. the thing throughout the golden age arc and maybe even in the entirety of berserk out of maybe dozens of sex scenes, there is only one where it is portrayed in a positive light. Yes. And that yeah. is Guts and Casca. Yes. And that one sex scene has a difference that I think all of the other ones, they all differ in that almost every sex scene in Berserk is someone who has a huge position of power or authority over the other person. L let's hold that thought for a second. Yeah, I'm sure we'll talk about this a lot. Yeah, in yeah. a little bit. Let, let, let's keep I, chugging but, on. But it, it was just one of those things where it's like, okay, I get it, Mira. The king is also kind of wanting to be in control of his daughter. I really didn't need him crawling into her room and sucking her titty. There's like, so uh, many pages of it. Ugh. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's he could have implied it and still got the message across. You don't have to was, draw it. Yeah, like it's just like I don't know. I get it. We can move on. <laughs> Which we will. Let's move on. Yeah. Let's move on. Uh, oh my god, it keeps going. Exactly! <laughs> it, it's... He was not cooking that day. I'm sorry yeah. to say. And like, it, it'd be one thing if, like, if there was something, like, demonic-related and it's, like, demons doing shit, I guess. No, but, it's like, human nature. Is... Everyone's a fuck. In, yeah, in this, this world. is excessive. Yeah. Like, and then, and then this man has the audacity to blame Griffith for the fact that his daughter, like, kicked him in the eye. Um, like, yeah. it's just... What the fuck? And I mean, I, th there's the thing where, like, she looks like his wife, right? But, like, whatever. Yeah. Like, it, it, enough and, spent on this trash. And, and, and the, other th the other thing, too, is also, like, there's no, like, lead-up. It's never, like, the king has never, like, said anything about that at all. It's, but well, he, probably, well. he probably did minorly, but... And, and like a passing note of like just saying like you're as beautiful as my as like your mother yeah. like so, something lovingly not creepy um <sighs> anyways banner hawk gets of course attacked and they get surrounded and they kind of get driven off of midland uh territory where they're now exiled from the uh they're now exiled from the uh from midland and they're just they're on the run um, and at the end of this section, uh, the stupid, I wouldn't say stupid, but like the jailer, the torturer gets the behalet and he throws it down the, uh, he drops it down the well and we see it drift off and it's like, oh, okay. I guess that like just solves our evil problem there. Right? Like we don't even uh, know. But it. it drifts off with the go, go, go sound effect. Like, you know, that that's resurfacing. I think that's such yeah. a cool way to show it. Like, um, yeah. cause you know, there's something extremely ominous about this particular send off to the behalet so i think this is like kind of like and bradley i don't think you probably weren't reading berserk or caught up to berserk when it was in the middle of the golden age i assume oh uh, no so but like i feel like this is a solid moment where like we we get a time skip at this point where like a year has passed um and and guts is now competing in tournaments and he's winning his own name um, I feel like in this section there's a moment where like people mention the like guts killing like a hundred people, but it's been inflated, and he he has an off comment like thought of like oh it's it's gotten that big now like I just think that's a really funny yeah um, oh yeah in 
I don't know if I don't really think this is a spoiler. It's kind of a running thing throughout the story. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like I think his accomplishments uh, kind of get bloated a little bit. Fifty thousand man killer guts. <laughs> yeah. But but like I also kind of like that because it's like he's a legend that's like getting bigger and bigger as like he moves on, right? Like I kind of like like that aspect of like it's, he's it's a, a cool positive trajectory from where he came from, where it's like. Hey, you know what? Yeah. It's kind of working out for me. There's hope in the in the in the air, and then you know, yeah. for us to hit that wall. So we get introduced to the Silhouette Warriors here for the first time as well. Um, they are not important now. They will be important a lot later. Um, They're the ones they fight in the dungeon run, right? For, for no, no. This is. This is the guy that has like the mask over his face, and he has like the what's the character in Tekken that he crawls around on all fours? Yeah, no, uh, he's not. Uh, he's not Vol Volbo. Um, I know who you're talking about. It's the it's like the Middle Eastern head garb guy. Yes, like he he's kind of like introduced. He's from a nation that's more important later in the story. Okay, I guess um, I haven't even gotten to that yet. No, it's it's like like I'm just now entering that arc. Oh, cool. Movie. Oh yeah, so, like the first time I got to that arc, I was like, damn, I didn't realize these guys would be such a big deal. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I like their designs. Yeah, I do too. Um, but like Guts fights him, uh, he wins. Yeah, this is just like a big action sequence that's happening here, but it ultimately culminates to Guts learning like the Band of Hawk is on the run and they're now like being pursued as criminals. Um, I, they're so... Guts gets back with Van the Hawk, and it seems like we're speeding along here, but there really isn't much that's going on here that isn't just, like, straight action shots. I will right? remark on his, like, grand return as, like, a freaking hero. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, like, they're so happy. Mira, <laughs> Mira draws Guts with the goofiest smile sometimes. I know, and I love it. That That's, like, those smiles need to be highlighted more. Like, he doesn't yeah. quite know how to look uh, kind or, like like a hero like he still comes off creepy i think it's interesting yeah, it's, and that's a, kind of a weird characteristic of guts where it's like he's grown up to be this tough guy who has to fit on a, on his own and like does a lot of killing so he it's hard for him to come off being vulnerable and like soft so i think that kind of fits and that's I the thing like, if he smiles it's like what the fuck's wrong with this guy <laughs> yeah oh man he's gonna kill us also um, i want to point out i think the pacing in this part of berserk is just kind of spectacular i think in less than 10 chapters there's the assassination attempt he leaves the band of the hawk um oh. griffith gets you know taken into the dungeon they get chased down and guts comes back like it goes you would think that's too fast but i actually think it's kind of perfect yeah yeah it's G going through it now it seems like yeah the stuff's moving at a good pace when we, when we get to guts at that tournament arc i call this the shonen arc of the series because it has a very like one piece pacing kind of like rhythm to it like things are going or moving constantly i don't know if that's the has, standard for shonen <laughs> it's, it's not but like it felt very like it feels very one piece and it feels very much like we're hitting beats and things are looking good for our heroes you know and we're getting set up in fights like we have like he uh guts is fighting this fighting this Silat dude and he throws the chakrams and like guts catches them with his like blade in his fingers and i think that's just a really funny moment oh, yeah. he throws them away <laughs> it's like okay it's 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 got a good like light-hearted feel where like yeah no one's like super rage filled right now like I, I, guts probably won't even kill these guys it's like a, just a fun fight a little bit yes it's a good like and after like a few chapters of like we're we're doing some very heavy-handed stuff and it's still pretty heavy because these people are on the run it's it's kind of nice that we get a nice like fight that we know we're gonna win yeah really and it's also it's, nice it's... seeing types of weapons we haven't seen before yes yes i like the You're... weird ribbon blade thing that, <laughs> that yes. one of those guys had um but everyone is so happy that guts is back casca is very standoffish a little bit um I'm trying to get to some more sticky notes here, but like everyone seems to be like guts. It's not your fault that Griffith did this move. Um, and even like Corcus, who's kind of like the big negative Nancy of the group is just like guts. It's not your fault. This is was his decision to make. And like, you shouldn't feel the weight of that soldier, the weight of that on your shoulders. Um, 
But Katzka, on the other hand, has other thoughts. Like, she is just very much just like, because you left, he did this. And she's not wrong, right? Like, it, it very much was, like, fueled by the th the idea of, like, I'm losing control of these people. Or that's what he's think Griffith is thinking. So I'm going to go take it out. And then that's going to cause me to lose more control and kind of, like, kill any kind of hope I have with uh, the Band of Hawk here. She might be having uh, thoughts like, Guts, you couldn't have waited, like, three more fucking months to leave? Yeah, you could have, not until, like, there's, like, a coronation or, like, a fucking ring on the fingers, shit like that. Um, but uh, they go off to, they go off to the side, and they, um, they have a, uh, conversation about, like, like, why Guts left, and, and what he's, uh, and kind of what he uh what that means for the band of hawk and like but casca is less upset about uh you know i feel like in this sequence like casca is less upset about guts leaving and what's happened to band of hawk and more of like guts leaving and she didn't kind of like was able to hold on to him and he wasn't able to stay um and like there's there's kind of this they've had this growing like relationship for a while and like what does this note say yeah, this this is like this page that I'm looking at here is just her like shifting the blame of whatever's all the things that happened on the guts rather than Griffith. Um so boom 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 boom. Oh, let's see. There is a good ironic statement here. God, where is it? Um oh, so Casca's like they're so Casca and Guts are like fighting. And Katsuka goes to that someone who wants to accomplish someone. This is a refer reference to Griffith. Uh, that someone who wants to accomplish something, if it's grand and endures that much more than other people do. Griffith had to make himself strong. But Griffith isn't a god. A person's heart can't be sustained by ideals and dreams alone. Hmm. Um, and I just thought that was just a very ironic statement considering what Griffith turns into afterwards. Some call and it foreshadowing foreshadowing um but that's an interesting thought there were like ideals and dreams alone couldn't sustain griffith like that which i think kind of hits home to the heart like griffith talks about like how much like he's driven to like go after his like goal but like what ultimately like caused him to fall wasn't necessarily like you know it being too hard or like the casualties of it it was it was the like it was the fact that like someone close to him decided to like walk out of his life. Even it was his twisted heart. I'm sure a Griffith before he met Guts and you yeah. know Guts kind of like locked in like that emotional side of the band of the Hawk. Like I, I mean, he, he completed it a little bit and got to Griffith. So like maybe an earlier version of him could have been sustained by just ideals, but ultimately it was his heart that led to his downfall. Yeah. So yeah, I just it. yeah. It's and I think that's some great like foreshadowing there, uh, from Casca. Um, anyways, you know, they like they talk a little bit more about Griffith and they talk about like how and they kind of come to terms that like you know, Guts is right and Casca is upset and Casca tries to kill herself. Um, Guts stops her and then they eventually embrace and they kiss and they kind of solidify like their feelings for each other. And then, like, it just cuts to the sex very quickly, which oh is Oh, my God, so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> but before we move on to that, uh, there's this picture at the very end of Confession, or this, this page at the very end of Confession, that I think is, like, a really good, like, job of, like, this romantic tension between them, how it's pretty summed up of, like, Guts likes her, but, like, Casca, like, puts down, and then she holds back, and then she realizes, then no, I need to, like, go and just... You know, I do like this person, like, leans in for the kiss. Uh, I think it's a really beautiful, like, paneling of, like, what's going on in their heads I particularly there. like, if you're talking about that six-panel se yes. segment, I particularly like panel four and five, where she's like, oh, yeah. and then she's like, should we? And then they both agree. Because, like, yeah, she's about to do it, they both reconsider it, and then they both go for it at the same time. Cute. Yeah. Look, at, look at Miura being a little romantic here. And then you know we get to the sex like immediately like it's just like right off the bat like we're gonna we're gonna dive right into this kind of a thing yeah <laughs> it's like oh. 
Okay. Um, and like just going through the imagery of like what happens between her and hit between Casca and Guts, it's that it's a lot more romantic and it's a lot more romanticized even to like it it feels magical it feels very like mystical almost like it there's a lot more modesty in these images like casca is covering herself up like guts is also fully nude and like he is not being i forgot to mention this in the other one in the other scene but like griffith's like face is constantly being concealed by like other elements like his hair or an arm a leg what have you like he is constantly like being shown in the shadows in this like mm. this moment of desire. And here it's a lot like, of flesh. Basically, like a, yeah, it only really like fades away from showing their full like anatomy in this one little panel where like yeah, uh, Casca, you know, she's she's in pleasure, so she kind of loses a little bit. But aside from that, it's just like bodies. Yeah, and I and think it, I, I like that openness of it because. These are two people who they they've gone through very similar things, very similar abuses, and they finally found the one person they can actually maybe be comfortable doing this with. So I kind of like that it's drawn more comfortable and more yeah. open air, like you guys said, as opposed to Griffith, where this is something that he did in a moment of desperation. It's a distraction for him. It's in the dark, different angles. It it's intense. also very, uh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Joe. It's also very bright, and it's not intercutted. Intercutted. It's not intercutted with like moments of something else, like Griffith or True. like Gut. Like is, they are focusing on each other. Is this the first really. daytime sex scene as well? So maybe that's like added yeah, nice. symbolism. It's not even at day. Like, oh, okay. That's the other thing. Too. Yes, I'm, like it, it, it's so bright that I couldn't even. I wasn't even exactly. sure if it was night. But like, and that kind of adds to the mysticism of it, right? Like, it's, like, this kind of very moonlit romantic rendezvous kind of a thing. Um, it's also way longer than Griffith's scene as uh, well. Like, <laughs> but not as long as the dad scene, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but then I mentioned them having full focus, but then we get interrupted by, like, Guts' big, deep, like traumatic moment of his life you know i as i was flipping here i wonder if it would have been even more effective if you turn the page and it cut straight to donovan as opposed to these transitional shots but either way it's still a fucked up page turn oh yeah, yeah. like it's it's like a it, and it's shocking because this has happened so far in the past but like it's a it's a shocking event like even for you as a reader that you remember that about guts like that's this very that's not something you just forget about him yeah, right i mean he like, he's also shocked you can tell by the, like the yeah. sparks in his head as it's happening and it's like, one of the but it's also one of those things that like we're not going to bring this up every hour because why would you um but it's, it, a, it's a repressed memory it's a good way yeah. to represent that and yeah, I just I think it's so good, and it's it really showcases like guts is not like guts. This is like guts at his peak. Like this is the like, guts at the happiest he's ever been. But this, he's always going to have this like baggage connected to him, right? Mm. Um, and whereas like you think if you want to compare this to Griffith and his scene, like that's he powers through that imagery of guts leaving, right, and like gets to the end. Whereas, like, Guts here stops and has to, like, kind of recoil and, like, rethink it, like, think about what's happening to him. And, and it's a huge mood killer, right? Like, there, <laughs> well, I'll say. Yeah. So I, it's I will also like, point out that, like, what led to this, and I forgot about this, is that Casca asks him to be more gentle, and then Guts is kind of an asshole. He's just like, no, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it up and she actually yeah. bleeds from this and that's what really triggers like what am i doing like i'm i'm doing the same thing that was done to me and that like causes the memory to come back and then he even like re like instinctively like reaches out to like choke casca right so it's even like that kind of moment of like in this pit of like enjoying this moment with somebody he he just instinctively has to like try to like end it or kill it right um, what he knows man this yeah. is a weird day for us <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> here we are you know, just we're... talking over multiple sex scenes i think we've all uh, grown today 
Um, but like you know, every in media, sex, everything's about sex except for sex. Sex always represents something else that's going on in someone else's life. Yeah. Um, and it's like this is kind of like the barrier where like guts never like got to experience, I guess, as like a man, and so, and or I'm sorry, let me let me back that up a step. This is something that like guts this a moment that was like enforced upon guts, right? Like it. He, like he kind of chose to be a soldier he grew up he was proud of what happened to him or like proud of being a soldier and proud of like of his combat prowess but like this is to him is his insecurity of like being so like open to somebody that he didn't need to feel like defensive and finally feeling that again for casca opens up those wounds and then he takes this moment to like talk to casca about it and rather than like casca kind of like going away or like and have a space she's staying there then to, to like be like no i'm gonna stick by you through these things even these old wounds that you've been experiencing that like that doesn't change my opinion of you and it's just kind of like a really great and sweet moment of like a healthy like i don't know if healthy relationships the right word for it but like a, a good relationship between adults of like understanding of like who each other are where they've been like what they're gone through and like how they're going to help them, each other out until it's something they... it's it's two broken people yes. doing their best yeah and and also just kind of like you know i think casca has this like she has this line which is like i want you to i want a wound that i say that i can say you gave me because uh i think casca has like they mentioned going back and forth the wounds that they both have on top of them and like uh Guts is also has like a stat blue from Casca in their first encounter as well. Mm. Um, so it's just like a, you know, they want to leave a mark on each other, but they want to leave a mark on each other that's a, in a much more positive life than everything else in their previous life has given them. And what's nice is after the trauma is addressed, it's actually gentle and sweet. Yes. But and the then last have... page is fucking fire. <laughs> you go from this super romantic uh, love scene here at the end, where it actually like, yeah, no, this one, this this last, their second attempt goes much better, and then yeah. you turn the page, just like Griffith's face suffering. Oh my god! I think that's that's a great like yeah. reminder of the last wedge of this triangle, but also impeding doom, where it's like. Among their happiest moments, Griffith is at his lowest, and we are going to proceed from that point. Yeah, I was going to mention the um, the the page where like you have this guts on the tree stump with the sword. How he mentions he always has to sword, have the sword by his side, and then like we get the imagery of adult guts without needing that sword by his side while he sleeps, um, which I think was a good like nice parallel. Really, um, and that ends uh, tome three. So we're going to shift over now to tome four. So go ahead, pop that tape out of your uh, tape track. Please Let's insert see. disc uh, two into your PlayStation One. Yep, <laughs> you don't need to rewind. Uh, you just gotta put it in there and just make sure you flip it all the way over and put it in there. Okay. So, uh, am I on the right page? Where the fuck do I get started here? So they're gonna try to break. Um, let's see. Never trust a sword to another person. That's right. Okay. So. We're in post post coital uh, glow now, and Casca and Guts are talking to each other. And Guts sticks with, "I'm going to still. I'm not going to join the band of Hawk. I'm going to just. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because it's my own path. Like he he. If anything, this solidifies to him that like I need to keep going after what I want and not just be hanging on the Griffith the entire time and what their dreams are. And ask Casca to join him. Great." awesome cool and they both kind of and they both agree and they and it's kind of like at this moment the unofficial kind of resignation of the band of hawk of like we're going to get griffith and this will probably be the end of this entire like lifestyle that everyone's been having right like these two people have made that decision <sighs> one last score yeah um however inter after that we get reintroduced i'm gonna turn my camera back on just for like a second where we get it reintroduced to this guy yeah that page uh, is crazy ooh. good it's so good like this is like joe's it, referring it, to the giant snake with hand monster <laughs> that's walking through the possible. forest yeah and it's like, like 
And th and this is significant because this is the first apostle that we see Griffith takes down in chapter one, correct? So like immediately, this is the sign of like we're getting back to where we started. Mm, this that's is the interesting. Beginning. I don't I don't remember that. That's cool. So, it's it's a great way for Miro to be like, we're now getting to the part where like this thing is showing up again. So now we have we are getting we're going to experience what led to the causation of all this shit coming out. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, now something beyond human knowledge has begun to stir. That's the last line of that chapter there with the snake apostle showing up. Um, we think in a chapter that really goes into Griffith's background of him being like a street kid and seeing the castle in the distance and what he's really thinking about like during this time in prison. And would you have it? He's thinking about guts and uh, just like how guts has affected him and how like you know guts has helped him get to that point of his life of like having that goal like guts is the reason why i was able to get to right here right now in this moment and he's the one that would like that brought me uh to as high as i did at least like that's what we think we should be inferring here but i think it's more of like that resentment is starting to set in that's what i was thinking like it feels like he's starting to hate like properly hate guts a little bit yeah then we get spooky bullshit um you know like just things coming out of the wall yeah, dark soul style i can't believe they ripped off bloodborne in this one yeah i can't believe it we get some glimpses of the god hand again which i think is really cool um but that's a but we are but we're seeing like griffith's mind starting to untangle and kind of like this is the thing that's going to really drive him over the edge um and, and become, make him become the final version of himself um we cut back to the band of hawk and they've agreed that they're going to go out and rescue griffith and they have a person on the inside to do so um uh, before we move on here I, I there's some logistical things that just weren't clicking in my mind and bradley you might have a better idea but the, the band of Hawk like split up into two groups and then one group was like group A that was going to reunite with Casca and the other group was going to like hang off to the side and recover. Am, am I remember that correctly? Yeah, they're uh, like two groups. Okay. Because there's a moment that happens later that makes it seem like the entirety of the band of Hawk gets destroyed uh, before they should have happened. Uh, yeah, I think their problem was I think all of the actually competent people like Guts and Casca and Judo and stuff went to go rescue Griffith. And I yeah. think they left Corcus in charge of everybody else. No, Corcus went with them because okay, Corcus is alive. Real. Yeah, they left Ricker with them. There you go, which, there you go. Which is ironic because Ricker doesn't get involved with the advent later. Um, so... They, they find this headstone, they start exploring, they go on the ground, and they pop out, and they find that the princess is the person that is, like, their person on the inside. Um, which is a, a good person to have, all things considering, because that's probably going to get you a lot of, like, easy passes into where you need to go. Uh, this is the point. At this point, the princess reveals to Casca and the group that the reason why he's in prison is because he spent the night with the princess. Which immediately has an effect on Casca of this kind of jealousy and like I guess resentment towards the princess I'm really interested to know like what y'all thought if like if Casca was aware of this the entire time do you think she would have gone back and taken Griffith knowing that like he had done that or do you think her opinion of like what they needed to do here would change at all and you know that's really interesting to think about because we always knew that Casca had something that would be more than admiration for Griffith. Yes. Definitely something romantic. And, you know, we get the sex scene between her and Guts, and then we immediately cut to Griffith's agony. And, you know, you can view that as Casca has moved on from Griffith now. Like, Guts is her person. She feels safe with him. She loves him. But not quite. But not quite. You get to this, yeah. and it's like you, you almost wonder if Griffith was never separated from the band of the Hawk, would her and Guts have even shared that moment in the first place? Mm -hmm. My take just, uh, and I don't think this is how I felt at, fell at first. This is just me scrolling by. Yeah. She, they cut to her looking out the windowsill as the sex is happening uh, with Griffith and the girl and the princess. 
Yeah. I take that as like she's always had suspicions and like never had the confirmation and hearing it here now just kind of stings and brings mm-hmm. back all the emotions from that night as she's waiting for Griffith to get back, not knowing exactly where he is, but suspecting it all along. Yeah. Um, moving to the next chapter, it were immediately reminded about what happened between the king and the princess. It's like, God fucking damn it. Let, let, uh, me, let me be. <laughs> yeah, it's like, Jesus Christ. Um, there's a lot of just like the princess, like being very adamant about going with them. Uh, feels very Princess VVS, although less because VV could actually do something. Um, but She's trying her best here. She doesn't yeah, have a cool like, duck. Yeah, like it feels very short. Like I was reading this, I'm like, I'm getting weird Alabasta vibes or of just like, we have a princess with us, we need to go rescue and like stop this well, cr- crime that's well, happening. you're clearly seeing the beginnings here of the transition yeah. to a shoujo manga like Berserk was supposed to always be. Yeah, <laughs> this is the, the start. Um, so during this, so there's not a lot of talk about the Griffith. Uh, I think end of here right now because we're still ma- moving our way into the tower. We're kind of just doing a little bit more of expo- expository dialogue between what has happened since the Band of Hawk left, and it's nothing really too much to press to like. I think go over unless Bradley, you know of something that I've missed in that aspect. No, I think um, we're doing good. Yeah, but. What's important here is that Rick and goes leaves the camp that has the people that are recovering from the battle, um, and sees an elf figure fly around, um, only to like get distracted and then comes back to find that the entire camp has been burnt down. Um, this is crazy. Like looking back, yeah. this is probably Mira's best foreshadowing so far, as far as I've yeah. gotten. And I think what was really cool because like I mentioned how like the Griffith side of this story of Griffith, the Griff, the guts side of the story feels very shown and it feels very lighthearted and it feels like an adventure kind of story going on. But he goes back and it's like, remember there's dark things happening in the woods and it's becoming like, more per- like skull Knight into the snake yeah. thing, into this, into the Behalit yes. and the bloodborne demons. Like, you yeah. know, we're getting there. Yeah. And so we get reintroduced now to the slug man monster um the with goat. some ah, attack on boy. yeah <laughs> christ <laughs> this page <laughs> like th- this is mira's monster design skills at work that thing looks yeah. awesome R- referring to the two page spread of him on a uh, chapter even the festival one which would be uh hold on i got this to help people uh, we're on 52 yeah right now uh yeah so it's we're like we're being reintroduced um we have god like we we kind of get re we get introduced now basically to everything that like guts is going to end up fighting after this whole event right like we get introduced to the slug man we've seen the snake apostle uh there's a pile of bug people like what the fuck um <laughs> this man's and, crazy and then we get this moth girl as well, which um, I kind I really don't like the way she's drawn now that I know the background of this character, um, but it's fine. But in the middle of all this, we meet Skull Knight again, which lines up with what we would think about. Like, oh, Skull Knight is probably in line with these demons. He talks a lot, but he has the same font when these mm. demons talk. Which I think is like incredibly intentional. Like him and Zod have the exact same font when they talk. That's cool. As a as a dirty Scandalation reader, I don't get uh, yeah. I don't get privy to that information. So when I was reading this with Skull Knight, and he tells them to withdraw, and it's like, um, and it's like you shouldn't have time to amuse yourself at slaughter a place like this. Haste is needed, is it not? Like I figure that Skull Knight is like the opposite of Zod, of like. Zod is kind of going around. He's like, I'm going to just do whatever I want. And then whenever I need to go make sure something happens, I'm going to do it. Like, he feels very much just like, I'm working for the grant for a greater scheme of things, but I'm going to indulge myself. Whereas Skull Knight feels more of like, things need to happen and get done. Like, that was my first intention here. Like, he's more of the, like, honor-bound, quote-unquote, character of this bunch of demons that's going to be like, You've had your fun. Go and take care of what you need to go do, kind of a thing. Like he's getting them in line, which kind of terrified me. Like, who is this character now? Where he's 
directing these demons and they're listening to him and like they don't fight back they like they don't even talk to him they just leave like that's like the crazy thing is that there's some weird amount of respect towards skull knight from these apostles um and then skull knight doesn't even kill rickon doesn't even say a word to him he just leaves like what the fuck is this man doing <laughs> i so i just and like we're just being introduced more and more of like this character of like how what is this relationship between these bad guys and these apostles and these demons and like what makes him so different but also the same right and we get this really cool shot of him like jumping over the moon yeah um, great page really like so i i this that was the like the kind of the moment where i just went like what is happening with this character he's not like haunting rickon he doesn't taunt him at all or or say or warn him he just tells him to leave and moves on with his life it's just it's very strange um so we begin our descent into this tower um the windham tower and so now immediately after skull knight we get introduced to this legend of supreme king geyseric who was an emperor who was able to subjugate dozens of nations and establish an age-old empire encompassing the entire continent for the first and only time in history. Interesting thought, compared thinking about the person we're going to rescue, is that he created his own kingdom by uniting, by conquering. Um, no, one know, no one knows what country he came from or when or how he raised an army. Once again, Griffith just kind of shows up, raises an army, and is making his way to like creating his own kingdom. Uh, no records whatsoever remain regarding his account prior to the arrival on the stage of history. Even Guts mentioned it sounds a lot like Griffith. What's interesting is the page after this is that we get a shot of him with like this skull helmet on, which immediately sends like red flags to me of like, oh, this is who Skull Knight was or is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's very obvious. But, and, and I think that's what you're trying to do here. I have my own personal theory that this might have actually been Zod, potentially, um, or someone else, because like there's a section of his helmet that has more of like a lion's kind of look to it, um, that that I think may be more encompassing, or like it might be something that Zod ends up taking more of an affection for. Um, I'll let Bradley it's... comment on that because only he yeah. could be able to. I will decline to comment. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. But what's even more important is that right after this, um, Jodo even mentions that I've heard of the fairy tale of the Skull Knight, uh, and he mentions how the gods decided they couldn't condone the Skull Knight's deeds and sent five angels to break up his empire. And then he's corrected the being saying four. Um, so this is obviously relating to like the god hand, but it's also interesting because he says five, and we know eventually there's going to be five, but there that can't be true because there was four, right? Is there any like, hint to there being like a previous god hand? Like right, a, that's either either a previous set of five or a fifth member who's no longer there. Because otherwise, we're talking about time travel, baby. I was thinking this might be a Jeremy <laughs> Bear Me kind of a thing. <laughs> You're gonna have to clarify for the people at home. That... Well, in the good place, there is a. A good place like heaven and hell don't work on a straight timeline. They work on a timeline called Jeremy Bear Me, where basically time like folds in on itself, and then you can experience events that happen after events before that event actually happens. Um, but basically, the idea of like maybe like if Griffith becomes the god hand, he ends up kind of like becoming it throughout all of time potentially, and kind of like maybe radiates across like what the fuck? that is trippy. Times. I yeah. need to reread this this stretch here because again it's been well over f four or five years since I properly read this stretch. Uh, yeah. This is badass, and I'm sure Bradley has some future knowledge where he can look at these pages and be like, "Hmm." I was about now, to say, like, this is a particular stretch of chapters where even hundreds of chapters later, you can come back and see stuff, even if it wasn't talked about, like stuff in the background, and you're like, "Oh my god." I feel now, like this might be like the moment where he was locking it in. We, he was flying yeah. by the seat of his pants a little bit, but like this is where maybe these last two or three chapters is where he got a lot of the structure for the future of the story. So I want to 
point out one panel here to keep in mind. And Bradley will probably latch onto what I'm thinking about here. But there's a panel on, I, I don't have page numbers here, so I'm sorry. But there what? but like right at, when you turn the page from this spread of the angels, um, there's, there's one page where it's a shot of them going down the tunnel. And then the page after that, they talk about the tower. And they talk about how the Wyndham Tower is said to be the Tower of Rebirth was built in order to seal the unclean past. And I think this, in particular, is huge foreshadowing to an arc that happens later. Oh, yes. It kind of sets up the rest of Berserk. Um, so I think you're right there, Willer. Like, Mira is locking in what he wants to do now with in this, like, section here because he's laying the groundwork. This is why I'm glad that even though, like... All, all my notes of stuff I actually want to talk about are from the Elf Arc onwards, where I caught back, yeah. I, I picked back up, but, like, I'm glad to be here, because you're putting these things in my mind and refreshing them so I can appreciate yeah. the story going forward. It's also kind of heartbreaking getting to cool shit like this and being like, oh, this guy had a really good plan for the future, and he yes. didn't get to finish it. Like, this is extra crushing for me, because I'm seeing, I'm remembering potential that may not get capitalized in the future yeah mm. and it's it's really sad yeah uh also this imagery the... in the next page insane this is it's... dark souls this this page birthed actual dark souls yeah this where it all started <laughs> is so sick and then like so we get the torch following and we're like and we get these like roman root root like ruins which i think is great because like that's kind of like our our time of like Rome was a huge empire. It fell, and then these medieval uh, medieval kingdoms sprung up around the old ruins. But more importantly, we get to the corpses at the bottom, and they have the fucking brand. Like, what does this mean? Uh, 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 explain like I'm five. I, I know what the brand is, but what is this imp like? What is this portraying? Whenever you are being sacrificed for the advent, you get this brand on you. Mm, so everyone so there was a past sacrifice so maybe one of the other god hands came from yeah. this exactly yeah. very cool exactly. yeah so it's it's one of those things where it's like it it's in retrospect after you see the ad you're like oh fuck that's what happened previously um so i i think i like i saw that image and i was like this is great <laughs> like we're setting up and we're kind of understanding like how like the world has been operating for the past hundreds of years in this like in this world we get to the bottom of the staircase um which is still several hundred feet off of the actual ground of this place um and we find griffith broken beaten scarred flayed yeah. mutilated just not even the man he was he's seen like, better days for sure oh yeah for sure he's so horrific that they take off his mask and like even us the reader like doesn't get to see it which i think is a great way of doing because you think about all the shit that mira has drawn all the horrendous looks like the exploding faces the 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 violent sex scenes the monstrous creatures we've seen but we don't get to see what griffith looks like in this state like, that's how bad this is. Damn. <sighs> I mean, he's still got his eyes. How bad could it be? He's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah walk, walk it off. <laughs> yeah, walk it off, kid. So what your, your fucking Achilles tendon is severed? Uh, yeah, so what your spine is barely hanging in there? Yeah. Um. So we have this very just kind of, like, heartbreaking moment of, like, Griffith, like, just barely able, able to, like, hold on to guts. But, like, at the same time, like... You can look at this panel and you glance at it and you're like, oh my god. He's trying to like hold on to guts for dear life, but in reality, he's reaching up to guts to choke him. Yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, let's get the through line of like I'm well, you said this arc stretches out for a little longer than we thought, but Yeah. Like just the most interesting part is his nonverbal hatred, like he's seething yes. right now, and like He's not glad that he got rescued. He's fucking pissed. And, like, a, like, he's just so broken. And, like, you could see from the intensity in his eyes when he sees Guts. Yeah. Like, he, you're the person that led me down this path and, like, caused me to break and ruin everything. And, and like, he and this, It's like, that... how dare you look down on me and cry on me? I am... So, I was yeah. so beyond you at some point. 
Right. Um, uh, the jailer shows up and he starts talking as this lisp. Um, and then Guts immediately uh, breaks down the door, stabs this man, cuts out his tongue. And he has a 1980s action line of like, I can't hear you. Speak clearly, and tosses him off of the fucking. Yeah, get smoked. I know. I was like, man, that's rad. Um, so, anyways, going forward here is just a lot of action sequences of guts running upstairs and killing dudes. Um, I like this paneling here. There's a lot going on, but like, I think when you follow it, I think it's a really good way of like just. I think it's a really neat way of showing Guts how he's, like, ascending the stairs and how much closer he's getting to, like, freedom as he comes bigger and bigger and closer and closer to the page. This is one of my favorite um, Guts uh, Busto segments of, of the arc, as I recall. Yeah. <laughs> Where he it's uses... also just, like, it's cool, the imagery of ascending the staircase out of the dark of a place that we've already been told is called, like, the Tower of Rebirth. I think there's cool symbols yeah. in there. Yeah. And uh, so we make our way up here, and we it's it's like literally like this whole chapter is like guts is gonna fight everybody, and we get this kind of great like rapid like guts does the like square square triangle charge move and cuts through everybody, move fifty seven kill combo you know it's a classic. Yeah. Get a hundred berries. <laughs> um, so then, uh, the king hears about the escape and he summons the. Baki Haraka, is that how you pronounce it? Baki Raka. And we get this like silhouetted shot of all these people here. Um, so I'm like, once again, giving me strong son vibes. I'm like, ah, oh, Baroque works. CP9, oh, here they come. This is every villain of the week group, but like, yeah. there's been multiple of these in this story alone. The Rhino Warriors or whatever from before. Right. Like, these are just, <laughs> this is classic Berserk at this point. You can't put this anywhere else. I will say, the cover page of the next chapter makes it very clear. It's like, oh, we had we had uh, Guts on his road to recovery and becoming a better person. Nah, the bitch is back. Like, the beast has returned. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, you see him. He's enraged. There's blood all over him. I also like, in this image here, his left... Like, you can see clearly his right arm is fully, like, organic. Mm. Um, but then his left arm is completely covered in armor. And his right eye is shrouded so you can't see it. So it harkens back to that black swordsman of having the mechanical hand and the eye missing. It, um, it, he's transitioning to what we know. It's it's all like a yeah, lot of transitioning. He's about imagery. to go berserk. <laughs> Does he ever say that ever? Don't you know what? Don't spoil me. I'm gonna pop off so hard when he berserks oh, all over the place. People have like I'm sure it's said multiple times in the story. <laughs> well, Roll there's, credits. There's a distinct moment that that will come up later that I think that was super hyped that gets revealed. He says um, it's berserk in time and berserk's all no, over the place. You, they get an item. Um, oh, I so, know about the berserk armor. That that's okay. Related. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they have this fight in the sewers. I think it's the sewers, right? That they're crawling through to get out of here because they go back through the tunnel that they use. Not enough the rats for for reference. I will say this page with the long man is almost as scary as any monster imagery Mira has drawn so far. Yeah, the, it's the long leg one. This now this guy is a one piece. Look at his fucking pr pr like proportions. This is, this is an enemy type that will get you every time you go in the fucking sewers of Dark Souls because you just forget about them and they jump on top of you from the ceiling. Oh yeah, this uh, is the you have to die to learn that this is a mechanic enemy. <laughs> like, yeah, you're like fuck. All right, and then after that you're always looking at the ceilings whenever you walk into oh, yeah. the room and then you it fall down a hole. Um, I like the different fighting styles that these guys have. Like we have, like we said, the long man that's like crawling around the walls. We have Fish Boy who's like has his trident and is swimming in the the pond underneath of him. Um, we have uh, Goblin Blow Dart Man who is I don't know how he's fitting in these tiny little holes and blow darting people. Um, this guy is working on, jo on JoJo Part One logic for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, the princess gets poisoned. And so the Bucky Rocker are like, time out, hold on, let us get the princess out of here, then we can continue what we're doing. I very uh, strongly remember this being my favorite uh, fight in all of Golden Age. Oh, it's really memorable. Yeah. It's just yeah, a lot yeah. of fun. This one stuck with me for sure. It's it's very cool. It, and it's great because, like, it's, it's just the, the rare... Uh, no, okay. go ahead. 
I was gonna say it was like it's the rare kind of fight where like I feel like everyone that's in this like band of hog has something to contribute to the fight. Exactly, and, like, they... it, it's the most like we're not just swinging. There's like choreography for everyone. It's got power of friendship, team up moments. Like, yeah. it, it's it's all my favorite jams. The weapons are interesting. Everyone has like a weird, non typical, non nighty fighting style. Like it's exactly more up my alley. So like maybe that's why I remember it so well. I think I think so. And like, because I, I definitely got that feeling of like, oh, this is like, everyone's got had to do something to beat these people. Mm -hmm. Um. So the princess is dying here of poison, and the the handmaiden or assistant is going to help her back to the castle. Guts like mouths something to her, and I'm very curious to know what y'all think that was, or at least Bradley, like what you think he's saying to her or trying to say to her, because like number one, this is in Japanese, so like reading you lips is not going to work. Sorry, out you for said us. guts. You mean Griffith mouth something? Oh my her. Griffith! I'm so sorry, Griffith. Yes. You know, um, it took me till today to realize they're both G names. That's yeah. just throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, like, what you think Griffith was saying to her or was trying to say or whatever. I don't know if we'll ever know. I know. It's just, it's one of those things that, like, is just, what could he possibly be saying to her? It's like she she just saved his life. You know, I, I just can't imagine it being something sweet. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. And, like, Griffith, we've talked about how ethereal and mysterious he was before. He's doubly so during this portion of his life, where it's like, is yeah. there any any shred of humanity still in this character? I don't recall seeing anything that would say yes in this yeah. portion. And I, I think also, like, it's hard to... I think one of the things about reading this as like for berserk of like because the golden age is so well known we know where how it ends like it's hard to like read the golden age and not know how and like see everything that griffith does and like not have that lens of like you know yeah. uh of of like this man's an evil man he's he's going to kill hundreds of thousands of people a thousand people whatever um and it's just you know what could he be saying this moment? Because, like, you could, if you're going to apply and read through and don't know about him, about Griffith, you might think this is sweet. But we're already in the media assumption of, like, he's saying some nasty shit that's, that's I'll, like, fuck you. I'll be I charitable, and I'll say it's a simple thank you. Uh, yeah. Just just based on there not being too much mouth movement, it, it feels mm -hmm. like it would be a four-syllable. I mean, thank you is not four-syllable. It wouldn't, arigato would. Uh, it's yeah. a Japanese it's manga, true. so I'm gonna say I'm gonna be terrible and say that. Yeah, I think that's a good thought there. Um, anyways, uh, once she leaves the arena, times back in, um, <laughs> we start fighting again. Um, we and then we get introduced to this guy that just chucks spears down the a curved hallway. So cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, and like the force of this, I like this shot of guts of like guts is, was standing here. Gets pushed all oh. the way back here, and the spear keeps going past. That is him. so good. Yeah. yeah. The impact points to show the distance he traveled just from blocking mm -hmm. the attack. Yeah. And then, of course, Jado um, uses the daggers in the metal to make sparks off the wall so he can see where that guy is. Oh, this and, is like, my favorite shit. Yeah. That's, fuck <laughs> that's fucking sick. This is so. Yeah. I like, like. This is like clearly now we're reaching into anime combat where like we're stretching logic a little bit, but that's what I like. Like I'm super yeah. into it. You realized you can't just do the same shit for infinite chapters. And I mean, Miura knew that all along. I think he was yeah. like, "This is gonna be the grounded portion of combat, more or less." There's still a dude swinging a sword through yeah, five yeah. other dudes, but now he's like, "No, no, we're going sane and shown in combat for real." Yeah, and um, you know they. The, the one that was always got me was like, why the fuck does he want Pippin to just hit the wall? That seems really weird. And then he's like, oh, you need to make enough sparks so everyone can see where they, they were going to show up. And they all, like, take down their respective uh, dudes. Um, how did they kill the man in the wall? Did they end up blowing him up later? Like, I forget how that operated and worked. Uh, or did, did Pippin just hit the wall and, like, it just killed the guy when he hit the wall? Maybe. Because uh, he kind of just disappears. He, he saw the odds, and he just kind of scurried away. Yeah. He's like, fuck this. Anyways, 
we move on and then the female of the bakiraka appears and i i feel like this is just like mira be like oh she's hot and we're gonna make it fire uh of course like it's simple yeah so simple man simple needs uh anyways they escape by b- busting hole in the wall and the bakiraka th- what's left of them gets like executed by the king and at which point the king uses the last of the knights we have not seen which is the black dog division um the, which which i was going through this and like i was i was going through the baki rock i was like yeah and then at this point they escape and then that's when we go and do the eclipse stuff why is there so much stuff left in this volume <laughs> and i was just like fuck this guy completely forgot about him this dude is a total degen yeah like it's it's the worst of the worst like he is just horrible and i i really don't have a lot to say about wild i i think i don't remember a lot of what he does maybe it's for the better we could just brush it off i I will say this is how he's introduced i mean he's just going to town i think the most notable thing about him is that this is it's a zod like encounter Yes. that we don't get out of for free. Like Zod, we got out of for free when he saw the Behilet. Then other apostles showed up, we got out of it for free with Skull Knight. We do not get out of this guy for free. And right. the, dude, the God, the panel I always remember of this guy is he just puts his fingers on two sides of this guy's skull and then yeah. slowly squeezes them together and the guy's eyes pop out. I'm like, Jesus. Yes. And, and this is like one of those things where it's like this is another apostle and like to me like this is also me going like well i want them to like have a big boss fight kind of thing at the end so they have a big like fight they have to do but i don't want it to be zod because zod's kind of rad so i don't want to kill him off so i'm gonna make someone that's kind of like him is this guy uh, a demon or just a deformed gross man no he he's is an apostle. An, he is an apostle okay okay he, yeah. he's a wannabe zod yeah and it really feels like that when i was looking through this like it's just, just like uh, uh, like it's just we mira it felt it feels like this is me like bashing on it a little bit but like it feels like this section for you is like mira was just like i want them to find an apostle and like really struggle and see like this final moments before like guts becomes the big like killer that he is it's lengthy um, i'm like going through the chapters here yes it's so long um i feel like we could have just like I, that last fight going up the tower was so good, you know, like yeah, and, and like not that this like I'm seeing a lot of cool moments in this fight as well. It's just like mm-hmm. it, you, I remember you mentioning last time how it feels like a bunch of sports teams uh, that we're going through, like villain of the week groups, yeah, and like oh this team yeah. has the best goalie in the league, <laughs> like they're safe for last kind of thing. Yeah, and dude, I just um, want to say. Mm-hmm. I feel like Mira, when he was drawing this arc, he's like, I'm gonna make this shit unadaptable. Uh, so, some of the panels he drew, I don't think, I don't think Wild is in the anime or the movies. I don't think he's they, not. I don't think they adapted this because it's, I don't know, man. Berserk has a lot of fucked up imagery, but uh, there's some really bad shit in this. This one. is like the, the peak of it, I think. This is like the point where Ramiro went like, this might be a little bit too much. And we see some bad things later, but, like, there is some heinous shit that happens in this arc. Like, but I do like this introduction of him, of he's this prisoner, and you get a sense of, like, Wilde is purposely being a prisoner. Like, you, you, he's trying to get into, like, this section of the kingdom, right? Like, he, he's infiltrating it somehow. Because he goes in, and he's like, oh, I'm gonna kill this guy, I'm gonna get you in your statue. And he... He, he yeets him all the way up to the top of this tower and kills him by impaling him on this tower rod. Like, it, it, it it's kind of like that seed of, like, those demons, like, infiltrating, like, the world, kind of. So, it's... And, you know, do as you wish. Uh, so we move on. Guts gets help from a village. Uh, I like this shot of Griffith, like, seeing his dream just evaporate in the horizon like everything that he worked towards everything he tried to accomplish is now being like it's just disappearing as they move down this road it's like what's even the rescue now i just 
I'm just bedridden for the rest of my life. What? Yeah. <sighs> Which is why, like, you know, maybe, maybe that was a thank you. Maybe, like, yeah, I hate Guts, but maybe I'm glad I'm getting rescued anyways. But as these events are happening, like, it's sucking all the hope out of this guy. Like, the little shit he had left, maybe. Yeah. And then, uh, immediately, uh, uh, while in his group of dogs end up in the little village that help Guts, and they kill everyone and rape all the women. Because, you know, why not? Gotta meet uh, the quota. Yeah, gotta meet the quota. And it's, it's just horrible. It's just... just it, yeah, absolutely. it's just awful. Um, Guts oh. cuts a few of them down. There's, like, this section here is a lot of fight and chase sequences. I'm getting... Um, I, I, I was skipped ahead since it's a lot of combat, and I got to this part with Casca and Wild, and like, oh, God, there's the heinous shit you were talking about. Yes. Um... I have a note here that it's just like a lesser zod. I do think he does some has some really good like disturbing imagery of that disturbing imagery that's like a little bit more artistic, like this yes. portrait oh, yeah. of of him. I think like that's great. That's a really good like dark image. I think that's really great. The and, intimidation like, even, factor I, is is important. Yes. Here. Yeah. And the thing is, like, I don't have a problem with Wild being a Zod stand-in for, like, them being this, like, we're going to have one last Apostle fight to really kind of, like, put us over the edge. I think the problem I have with it is just it's so... It's kind of like with the King scene in, in the the bedroom where it just feels excessive, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it really didn't need to be so excessive, I oh, think. Yeah. But um... It's whatever. I don't know what points you want to jump on, but I will say a function of this fight that I'm noticing here as I'm uh, yeah. going through it again and revisiting mm -hmm. is that this is a fight where you have a naked Casca and Guts is fighting for her and Griffith keeps yeah. looking on in awe. Like everyone else is in awe, in awe and Griffith keeps looking on. I feel like part of this is showing to Griffith the bond that Guts and Casca were able to build even without him and it's just rubbing salt in the wound maybe it's like the function like the real function of this fight I think that's like really the big thing that I had from all of this was that it just is a I don't want to say excuse but it's an opportunity for Guts and Casca's relationship to really shine through of like what it's become and for guts or for Griffith to like really see like oh, in the time that I have gone, these two have, you know, bonded more together and have become more of a unit and become much more caring. And they are now in. They now don't need my love to support them because yeah. they have each other. And like there's um, a near like deep into the fight with like post transformation. Oh yeah. wow! By the way. Um, this is a fucking Yu-Gi-Oh monster. You can't oh, tell yeah. me otherwise. Oh, yeah. He, oh like, yeah, definitely. <laughs> he's a he's one of those bad fusion monsters from the first series. He's got yeah. only twenty one hundred attack, and it costs three monsters to summon him. Got no special effect. Even have an effect? No, no. Like... He's just a beat stick. That's really bad. But yeah, the thing is, like deep into that fight, you have this section where Guts is getting his ass beat, and Griffith is biting his lips so much that it's bleeding. And yeah. I feel like it's ambiguous whether it's like a Guts, how could you lose to this guy? Or like uh -huh. the culmination of seeing how much Guts and Casca's relationship has grown. I feel like you can could, you could definitely read it both ways and maybe you have a more clear stance on it. I think at this point, it's it's kind of, I think Griffith is in this moment, is trying to decide like how he feels and like how he like, like, you know, like, where does he stand with these people and like what what and like he's going through a lot obviously but he needs he's contemplating like well if they lose i'm going to die regardless so nothing nothing i can do there but like if if they live what does that mean for my life like what does it mean from after this all happens and after everything i've seen what does that mean for the rest of my days and it it's becomes like, more go ahead bradley like they yeah. rescue him the leader but kind of only in name only he's like i'm i'm not gonna ever lead these people he can see yeah. that he's like they're never gonna have the respect for me that they once did and i think partial to that lip biting scene that you're mentioning willer i think also that's griffith wishing that he can jump in and help out if not just yeah. to help his friend but yeah. also to reestablish need for him right mm -hmm. like they need you need me to win this fight Frustration uh, at an action, I think, is most clear because after yeah. that, I think, is when he realizes how Casca really feels about Guts because she's crying and, like, 
pondering yeah. why Guts always needs to fight and put himself in danger, and um, Griffith has a very pensive look. I am annoyed at how much naked Casca there is in this in these scenes. Like I, yes, I, I don't fully see the purpose. But let him cook. He he's building up to his magnum yeah. opus here in a little bit. <laughs> That, the yeah that's the one thing i think is like i wish casca had a little bit more badass moments in in this section of the golden age right because she's very much playing the damsel here and um and i think that and i, I wish it really wasn't true or like she kept her armor on and was still fighting because then i think it makes what happens to her later so much more impactful right like this very heroic woman is reduced to this. Whereas, uh, yeah, like, like, kind I, of... I think it would have been improved. Like it's almost a disservice to the character to kind of yeah. put her in this position after all of her strong showings. And sure. She got some of the more comedic fights like we were talking about last time, but like, it just kind of feels like a disservice to railroad her into this, uh, like lesser, like not a lesser role, but a less powerful role, and then yeah, it, it well, could have been a, more impactful to ha give her a big moment and then strip it away yeah. in or the like following if, part. If Guts and and Casa worked together to take down Wild, I think would even be more impactful mm -hmm. because it really showcases like their bond together has made them stronger to take this down. Yeah, which is that. yeah, um, and I think of all of Berserk. Like, this is the section that I don't like them at. Like, this, it, it's really low for me. Like, I really don't like how it's kind of portrayed here. And, like, it feels, it feels very forced of, like, oh, there's a distance between where I need to get to and where they are going or where they're coming from. I need to throw in some sort of extra fight here um, to, like, not necessarily pad out the time, but to, to bring a little bit more depth to, like, Griffith and what he's thinking and, but I just think there's just some other elements that are just a way too excessive and it could be done better. Bradley, yeah. like, the, it's yeah. it's fun to finally fight an apostle. Um, mm -hmm. and win. And like, win. That's the other thing, too. Yeah. And, like, it's fun to finally fight an apostle, but, you know, the sheer creativity of this fight isn't nearly as much as the Baki Raka was. And, you know, at this point, you're just, you're, you're ready to get to the Eclipse. Yes. Like, yeah. And, and, and I was gonna ask, sorry, Bradley. Like, is this? Do you? Is there a consensus? Like, do do people generally agree that this is one of the weaker parts of the Golden Age? Um, in your in your experience with a fan base, or is it hard to tell? I think in general, this is just an arc that people don't have an opinion on. Which mm -hmm. to some people, that could be considered worse than being bad. Yeah. Is being forgettable. Yeah. Yeah. I. So there was this, there's a Lady Emily video that I watched, and she, like, outright says that, like, the wild segment of Berserk, like, is really harmful, she thinks. Like, it, it, it really does a disservice to the uh, to the story as a whole, because it, it kind of, like, it, like, it, it does the thing with, like, Casca, where she's a damsel, and, like, wild is just, like, an excessively disgusting monster that doesn't really have, like, any kind of, like, merit to him, like, doing that, but, like... It's it's a real bad back and forth because you want that dark tone, you want this sense of like these things are monsters and they're gonna do the worst things possible to people. So like yeah. you need to make those worst things possible, like human things. Like well, it's people. also tough because when you've raised the bar so high by making every human a despicable scum, you have to go like cartoonishly yeah. like horrible Even with worse. it. You have to go yeah. super jail like one of those Adult Swim cartoon tier. <laughs> Yeah, um, but we're gonna move on. I will uh, say this panel where Guts stabs a uh, Wild um, is an yeah. iconic Guts panel. I've seen a lot of people use that as like their avatars in places of the internet. Like, yeah. He's like stabbing yeah. him in the in the side of the neck. It looks badass. Yeah, I think that was... the, the imagery here is very cool. Um, it's great. Yeah, the art here is awesome. Like yeah, it, for that's, sure. there's no doubt. It's just I feel like. It's like watching a really good VFX shot in the movie, but you're like, that was kind of cool. But all right, let's move on. Um, so we're going to move on. Moving on to, after the chapter after this. Uh, this fucking page here, I could get this blown up and give it to my church, and they think it's a biblical 
<laughs> like it's an angel or something yes like or like it's it's in reference to satan or 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 like it's like a it's like biblical imagery i love Joe, this are game. you reading those satanic chinese comics again <laughs> yes um this is so good it's so cool um i i feel like this is actually a like a reference to a piece of art that i can't think but I just love how you get this image, this very light imagery that's usually associated with like angels descending. But instead, we look and like even the princess mentions it. But we know this like silhouette outline immediately. That's Zod. Oh, that's yeah. the big intimidating thing. That's the wall that we can't get past. This is the thing that is like descending down for us. This is doom coming down. It's like and we meet Zod and he says one day some horrible shit's gonna happen. He disappears for very many chapters and then boom, there he is up in the sky. I'm like, yeah. oh, get the horrible shit. It's, and it's so, and then we've talked about this before, but like Zod has such a simple design, but it's so effective to conveying like that pure devilry, right? Like he, it's such a classic looking design. Which is which sticks makes it stick out so much more to the other monsters in Berserk because they're so crazy that it gives them this immediate kind of like intimidation and higher ranking status because he fits the mold of like what we think a demon and a devil should look like. Um, so I just I just love that page. I turned the page and I saw this and like I audibly gasped when I read it the first time because I just thought it was so cool and I just think it it was just a great kind of very simple piece of art. Um, anyways. They, they, they we're on the road and we're recovering and so we're making our way downtown walking fast faces past uh we're somewhere bound mm -hmm. um yeah uh but guts and griffith are kind of having this very one-sided conversation where guts is trying to like you know act like griffith is still a person well he is still a person but like talking to him like he's friend like nothing's happened and trying to really kind of stick to his level but then he does this humiliating thing of helping griffith put his armor back on and like i, mean, I think that's it's tough he's like hey you want to wear the armor and then G griffith is just like he's not nodding or shaking his head at anything in the scene well there's a little bit of a head shake where he's yeah. looking at the armor here so i don't maybe he wanted this but it's still humiliating it's hard to tell and it's really sad because, like, Guts is genuinely just trying to be a good friend here. And, yeah. like, you know, Griffith's entire world and view of Guts has changed. But to that's not the same for Guts. Guts is still like, no, that's my leader and my friend. Obviously, he's yeah. different now, but, you know. It's fucked up because he's maybe the one person that's that maybe still looks at Griffith as Griffith. Like, he's looking mm -hmm. into the soul here. I don't remember if yeah. there's, like, many scenes of him, like, babying Griffith, but, like... I feel like he's the one person who's giving Griffith what he would want out of the world, but like it's guts, so it's just like it just doesn't mean anything to him. But like, if, but like if you look at these pages here, like he's being cradled in Guts's lap like a child is, like if you're putting on his shirt or his like pants, like he's he's being cared for, and that's not what Griffith wants. Griffith wants to be the, the king. I, the way that Guts is doing it in his diet, like, the the look that Guts is giving Griffith here is not one of I'm patheticness. Not saying, like, I'm not saying Guts is trying to mock him. I'm saying that Griffith, like, regardless yes. of Guts is trying to do, Griffith is fairly resentful. Uh, yes, absolutely, it. but I'm just saying that, like, just based on the way Guts is going about this scene, like, he is not like the others when it comes to Griffith yeah. here, I don't think. Yeah. And I think that's, and like we go back to the equality thing where like Guts has this image of like being equals. And at this point, Griffith is below being equals because he has to be cared for by Guts. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it, it just more and more like gets the wheels turning of like what he ends up deciding eventually to do. Um,. Uh, Wild gets up. He doesn't want to die. He's like crawling around yeah. trying to get back up to them. Um, and then he picks up Griffith and realizes who he is and starts telling him to summon the God Hand. Um, when you we, say he realizes who he is, what do you mean? Like, like I'm pretty sure 
the apostles know that Griffith is destined to be the god hand. Like that's yeah. the plan. Like okay. when Zod saw that particular Behilla, he's like he yeah. he immediately knew. He's like, okay, okay. I'm not going to fight this guy because you know I'm going to see him again one day. They read the news letters. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's kind of like this is why I was. It's it's saying we're like when Skeleton Knight is or Skull Knight is talking to the apostles he understands what they're go looking for and what they're doing and what they should be doing and is trying to get them back on that path to save to try to save Rick and who else um, is this is god's out. plan uh shout out to the drake song like is this like are, are they all connected by god's will and we'll talk about god when we get there because yes very interesting um, topic we uh and we get a glimpse back into hell and the swirl that happens there um so uh, while pleading for his life is the notes I have here. Uh, but like, I think it's just, just this is like kind of like Wild's key point here in the grand scheme of things is to seed into Griffith's mind using the helmet to summon the God Hand to get what he wants. Like, that's kind of like the point here. Um, but also, Wild shows that like he's broken, he's destroyed, he's he's no longer the man he used to be. And it shows that off the entirety of the band of Hawk and kind of like dissuades him, dissuade the band from like continuing to follow, follow Griffith. Um, and he's kind of using him in a hostage at this point. Uh, to what end, I'm not really sure. I think he kind of figured that he's kind of fucked regardless because Griffith doesn't have the behelet at this moment. Um, but you know what? He's fucked either way because Zod shows up. So, <laughs> oh my, wow. Once again, like this man loves drawing Zod whenever he gets the chance. God damn. Like, it's so good. Uh fun look at, fact, look at the fun yeah. fact in the scan that, that page of Zod is it, like uh, impossible to parse because it's so dark. But yeah, that, that is an insane double spread. There. Oh dude, like there's so many god tier drawings of Zod. <laughs> like it's I like if I could ask Mira, like is Zod your favorite character to draw? I'm like 99% sure it'd be a yes. Yeah. Because every time he shows up, it's like it's the coolest. So cool. yeah. yeah. It's like, like look. He, like, he, hits dude, him. he won't stop. He hits him with wrestling moves even. Like he loves this man. <laughs> yeah. Like he, it's every page he is on. It's the most detailed drawing he, he's ever done in Berserk. <laughs> He could just keep stopping himself. Uh, and uh, you, while you... Sorry, you froze there in time for a oh. little bit, or maybe I was in time. Okay. We were just uh, talking about well, Zod. Yeah, Zod, you know, uh, you know, just tells him that you're going to understand soon what all has happened in Leeds. Um, what I think is also interesting is that we see wild's true form of who he is which is like this old old man right so that's i just think that's interesting mm -hmm. and like what's kind of crazy is that we'll probably never get wild's like backstory as to why he decided to do that right because we got like the slug man's backstory and like how he you know what he committed there but like wild we just won't ever get we just have to postulate on do that. you mean why he decided to like uh taunt griffith and hold him or no i mean like what caused him to use the behelet to the summon past. the god hand right. and what he sacrificed and so on and so forth sure all right so now we're on to volume 12 which is the last volume of this tome um so a majority of this is going to be about basically the band of hawk coming together and figuring out what to do and it, a lot of it's it's at this moment where a lot of them realize like this is the end of the band of hawk we need to go our separate ways and we need to find what we're going to do now after this like Joe's like i'm going to make a thieves kill and even cask goes like i want someone at my side and leans on the guts and it's kind of like a revelation that like that's what she's always been looking for in griffith like she was hoping for somebody that could be with her and now she's found that with guts and then she goes and tends to Griffith in the uh, in the wagon, and she realizes how much um, he needs her in order to survive. Um, and then, like, 
we have this moment where Griffith tries to force himself again, not again, but force himself onto Casca. You know, here. I'm not super far into what happens after this, and Casca's barely in any of the material I've read. Um, yeah. But this feels ironic here. Yeah. How <laughs> she's having to care for Griffith, like just based on what I know of what her character becomes from Osmosis. Yeah, it's it's a reversal of fate, one would say. Um, Intentionally done, perhaps. Yeah. But you know, they they end up talking, and it kind of comes to the final like understanding of like this is the end. Band of Hawk is over. We're going our separate ways. People and like guts at this point has gotten the following where like guts we'll go and do whatever you want to do like we were we want to follow your blade and your path is the path we want to follow um i don't know if guts would let them follow him around or what he would have done but like it's just a big motivator for guts to showcase like oh you're getting the charisma the inspiration and the goals that griffith had and like you're you're getting to be the being where you want to be which is a man that has his own stake in the world and going after it and i think that's a good way of showing that of like he's inspiring others to like follow in his footsteps um Casca then kind of Casca then goes he's gonna she's then goes that's just gonna say griffith yada 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 and griffith is just sitting there staring at the two of them talking and and kind of coming to a realization of what his fate is going to be and we get this chapter of Griffith, like, having this existential crisis of, like, here's everything I've worked for, and my dream is disappearing, and, like, he has this, like, future sight of seeing um, Casca and him being together, and they have a kid who's named that for Guts, because, of course, that's the people he cares about, and, um, it could also be read where it was like you could also I guess read this where like he saw him and Casca as like the mother father figures of the groups and Guts and Pippin are Wait. The, his children. And he's dreaming of the child Guts, but in the future Griffith is is that moonlight child or whatever. So like Yeah. Oh god, there's layers to this triangle. But anyways. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. But but Griffith hijacks the car and he crashes and I love and Zod mentioned this, I think, in the previous chapter. And I forgot to highlight it, but he says like it will find its way towards you, which is just super ominous. And he lands in the puddle of the water and he finds the behelet that was taken from him. Um and then we move on to the eclipse. Uh a small little event. Have... We can we can brush through it. <laughs> Um, so of course we have the uh, the Infinity War reference here. Like you know, Mira was a really big fan of Marvel. You will like. I really do. I you know what? I I'm not afraid to say it. I really believe that they were inspired because like, dude, it's it's even 100%. the same color scheme in the movie. Yes, a hundred percent. Show me again. What were you talking about? Bring up the the 1990s scene of this. It's the exact. So you know how Thanos is in the. It's. So I, are y'all talking about the comic or you being assholes and they just trolling? No, I swear to God, like there's there's this scene with Griffith, right? And yeah. like Thanos sacrifices the closest person to him, and then ends up in this eclipse in like knee deep water, holding the yeah. stone in one hand, and it's like the same fucking. Oh, movie. you're saying oh, you're saying Marvel? Re yes. Okay, I thought you were saying yeah. you're going reverse. I was like, stop being little dumbasses. Oh, I was, I was I was making the joke that beer was inspired by Marvel. Okay, was... but Marvel was inspired for sure by the yeah. eclipse. No, yes, well, for sure, hundred percent. There is inarguable that the person setting up that shot did not see Berserk. Look at that shit. It's, Go it's, a, it's the same exact thing. The goats inspire I'm, goats, man. It, it yeah. <laughs> and like, that's not a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not saying oh, no. that. that it's, if it's if visual references are, are not fair in game, then all media just disappeared. Yeah. But it's, it's like just everything's one of, derivative to a degree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but like, it's just one of those things where like, because I remember Bradley saying that to me one time. And I was like, okay, I guess they they reference it. And I got to this page and went, no, that's like 100% like 
we are going to be we're using that imagery one for one to to and it's because it's the exact same like tonal feeling it's so good um oh yeah it's great it's awesome um so griffith gets the behelet the and the eclipse happens and he screams for them to stay away and like this is like the last bit of griffith trying to get them to uh get away from him and what's really cool about this shot is so like we have this scene here where like griffith is crawling backwards and you're like oh stay away and like if you're thinking about you maybe he's seeing something that is like horrifying but then you realize when we turn the page Mm -hmm. he's not backing away from the monsters he's backing away from griffith and company towards the monsters like he's finding sanctuary with the demons and the beasts rather with the band of hawk um so it's and you kind of see the, like how the change of fate and the but change then of who's life. he saying to stay back he's telling the band of hawk and griffith to stay away um, right either and you're saying like, just visually it's because he's like oh i know i know i kind of instinctively know what i just did and i'm on their yes. side yes yeah and it's like that last shred of like trying to save who he can mm-hmm. uh but like he can't talk, he can't do anything. And then of course we get our reference images for Attack on Titan. Um yep. <laughs> uh, he's just spawning the next multiple decades of popular media. Actually, genuinely, yes. like that's actually now that I say it, it's not a joke. This chapter is spawning so much things we love today. <laughs> like it's crazy. So and then Griffith is thinking, stay away, stay away. If you touch me now, if you put your hands on my soldier, I'll never, I'll never, never again with you. Like it it's 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 that resent is still is building up more and more and it's kind of coming to its peak now of like I'll I'll never be able to I'll never fight alongside you again, I'll never help you again. But Mira's keeping it ambiguous of like what is happening here. My and my just... translation has I'll never again forgive, but I think that's like yeah. prone to be more erroneous. Yeah. On the nose. Yeah. And of course we get a nice pleasant little Easter egg here. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the behavior is uh going through it. God, it's just some horrific looking art throughout the entirety of this. Now this uh... is a good emote. Oh my god, the fucking which one the the faces in the sky what year did yeah. this come out this is very earthbound to me Ooh, i don't know bradley you know uh, you fought gigas in the past right like this this screams gigas to me all the man, morphing I faces i wonder if, i wonder if earthbound did come out before this this would have been like mid 90s right exactly like 1995 in 1996 it's viable that visually one could have influenced the other depending it might have wait which one did you 96 is this 96 is the latest, so this probably came out around 96. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know when the Earthbound came out. 94, um, so. Oh, okay. So probably, like, Miro's like, that's a cool game. <laughs> yeah. Um, we flash back to Rickon real quick. And Rickon's getting healing powder from this mystic, and the mystic's talking about, like, oh, uh, the the moon and the eclipse, it's happening. Um. And there's a little footnote in my edition. I don't know if it's in yours, Will, or where they talk about how a, the star that suddenly appears in the night sky and scares people is called Kaito or Kito. Uh, the star that steals light from the sun or moon and causes an eclipse is called Rago, along with other Im- imaginary stars. They are ancient legends. Um, so it's just a neat little uh, I've Japanese. Definitely seen those names in Japanese uh, culture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rago, in particular, is one of Enel's Attack of Swamp Piece, for example. Cool. That's cool. Um, and then we get kind of reintroduced the pop, which is, I think, the, like, the nail in the coffin of, like, we're catching up back to where we were, right? Yeah. Like, this is, like, this is, this is the first character we're basically introduced to in the story, and this is, we have finally been shown this person again after, what, 50 chapters, is it, Willer? There was a little, like, wasn't there, like, a puck moment in Golden Age where, mm-hmm. no, okay. It's it. Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm so thinking we'll, of a puck moment in the. No, I'm thinking of something later. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. So, uh, fun story. Uh, when we were at Disney World, we were playing 20 Questions, and I thought of the character Puck. And Bradley asked me, do they survive the Golden Age? 
And I was like, yes. Because Puck showed up in this one page here. And so was <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. That one was fucking me up. It was it was like, oh, that it was like the one question that could really narrow down a lot of characters. But in this one instance, did not help at all. Uh, in fact, hindered Bradley in that game. Uh, so. But we get a lot of horrific things here, like. Just a lot of imagery and everyone like there's faces in the ground uh trying to get to my next stick now and then we have big woman show up um and all the god hands have their very spectacular entr entrances into yep. the stage evangelion was born now yes <laughs> um god what's this guy's name they give him all names lately but like oh big my... brain man <laughs> this transition of the big woman forming into like the the god hand lady whose name I don't know is insane. Yeah. This is incredible. Yeah, it's, I was, it's incredible in the manga, and I think the movies really did this whole sequence justice. It, yeah. It's tough to pop like the scale that then turns into like a woman. Speaking of unadaptable, this lady just like. I guess in I other know. forms of media, her wings must always be blocking the nips. Yeah, which... I think they're a little more. Uh, Mira, a little bit more. Mira loves titty nipples, so that that must yeah. break his heart when he sees or when he so, saw any adaptations. Um, when we first see the God Hand, like they're all of their designs are basically the same. Um, the the female God Hand member who whose name will show up eventually, I know because they have a panel here. Um, she is constantly being covered by her like wings constantly at all angles mm -hmm. um at this point we was like fuck it i've shown enough i'm gonna just that the titties are gonna be seen at all times now for this woman ah <laughs> uh, like, but the fucking brain guy that is the coolest void, intro man. ever man void is my i want to learn about void yeah badass <laughs> god hand appears oh man bradley there's i hope did i ever show you the meme of luffy and the gang as God Hand. No. Stop. <laughs> Stop this. this. I need to show you that image because it because like um Robin is the female version of the God Hand or the female God Hand well, character. That's okay. that makes sense. Team form. I'll have to find it. I hope the squid guy. I, I, I hope the no, I hope the, the squid guy is chopper. I, I'll have to find it. I forget who is. Oh, voice should be Brooke. <laughs> it's for <perfect. laughs> Oh yeah. Anyway, this is too stupid. Let's move on. The afro works on. so good for the brain. Um, yo, how are we doing the whole eclipse for real? No, no, no. We're gonna get to the end of this volume and then we'll be done. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know if we can handle that. Oh no, for sure not. But like, I just there's a lot of great imagery in here and um i originally my plan was just go like you, everyone knows the eclipse there's not much to talk about it other if you for like you know it but like going through i'm like there's a lot here that i really like imagery wise and storytelling wise and just in general like what the god hand does to manipulate griffith into making this decision right and making the choice to sacrifice everything i i don't uh, know if mira ever tops the artistry that's going on here maybe not like by character design or proportion but just like the abstract things forming out of shadows and, and the earth and suns becoming brain dudes like it's next level stuff I, ju I just don't know how these images synthesize themselves in a human's brain <laughs> yeah, yeah. I this image of the actual hand itself showing up and coming out of the ground is so cool. Um, oh my! This guy's inventing the the playbook right now. He he's he like he, he, like crazy. I mean, I guess like everything Lovecraftian influence us to be here and like some yeah. some movie stuff from the past. But like he's really setting the stage. Yeah, and so. There's a lot of elements that are going on here. Like, they're bringing Griffith up, and Guts is trying to stop him, and then eventually, like, the hand comes out, and the hand is made out of fucking corpses of people as well when it comes out of the ground, and they're dragging him up the uh, the, the arm into the palm of the hand. And then we eventually get to this moment where, like, the god hand has, like, takes Griffith into his own conscious being, right? And, like, Griffith is going through, like, all the events that kind of led him to like get to where he was and i love how like this imagery of like 
this has always been you. You've always been the person that's just laid corpses, just a road of corpses to where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And and it's like and they mock him for it, where it's just like you 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 let the you you've paved the road with corpses. You were never noble. You never did the right thing. Like it just you you killed hundreds of your comrades. You killed hundreds of thousands of your enemies. And, and I to was get where I was catching here that in the dream sequence, Child Griffith earlier is like, I'm not done. I still want to run in my paved road. I want to play in the sunlight. And this is a harsh yeah. reality. It's like, this is your paved road. It is not that childish fantasy you were yeah. having in the wagon. This is it. Mm -hmm. This like this is the what you've made for yourself. Like, And what's even worse is that they show him and like you were getting there and you still had a long ways to go. And you still need a lot more bodies to get there. And it's it's kind of like so you still had a ways to get to where you needed to go, right? It wasn't like you're close, like you think you were. You you still had to kill hundreds of thousands of more people. And so he's just like, well, why don't we just accelerate that process? You have a bunch of bodies here. Why not use that, right? Why not use this moment to accelerate your path to your kingdom? That's the thing. Uh -huh. There's There's the never-ending... Did Griffith do anything wrong in the Eclipse discussion? And the answer is yes. I don't know better what everybody on the internet tells you. However, I think this particular stretch makes the best case for maybe not. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, break it down I, for me. What is the counter argument? I, well, the counter argument people will give you on the internet is that, oh, well, everybody agreed to die for Griffith's dream. And I'm like, okay, they agreed are, to fight what? and maybe die in battle. Are you again. serious? That's that's their crowning argument? <laughs> yeah, people will be like, they know what they signed up for. And I'm what? like, okay, they, they signed up to fight in a, a human war, not get eaten and raped by monsters. Yeah. Okay. They signed up However, for a dream. Like, <laughs> now, I think this particular stretch where they are showing... Where, where Griffith goes into his own psyche here is very important. I think there is an element of manipulation of Griffith here. When they initiate... Oh, like, there's a panel where two of the god hand are stacked on top of each other disguised as the woman. Yeah, and whenever they initially ask him to make the sacrifice, there is a moment of hesitation in Griffith. We don't know if he'll say no, but after that hesitation, that's kind of what leads into this, and there's all these notes of like you've killed thousands of people to get here you would be a bad person if you didn't finish this off they're telling yeah. him you don't sacrifice these people that is what makes you a bad person that's pretty fire all of these people are going to die in vain if you don't let him get to his goal and let's not forget that like wild was egging him on earlier too yeah. like he was oh, yeah. publicly shaming him like there's clearly a bit of like i don't think griffith would have done this if not for these kinds of elements but also to get to this point where i think the eclipse started deep down in his heart the answer was there i think there's also that like i don't think this would have started if it wasn't like deep down it wasn't there now they're just egging him on to kind of like act on it and verbalize yeah, like get it. it over with yeah yeah and i like this panel so we there's a page here where they're describing the band the hawk and they're saying those who have flown you with you the hawk's wings the feathers one by one they should forgive you even if they are cr now crushed by despair like they're even acknowledging like these are the people that made you fly and made you get to where you were um like they're acknowledging that and they and so they should feel blessed to be instruments in your ascension and because that's what they've always been to you and that's what they've all and that's what they agreed to like what people would say it's like they wanted to be the thing that would carry you to your dream so give them that and use them to get to your dream um very compelling argument by these godly beings gotta say they're they know how to play the game yeah uh i really like this shot and i love the creepy imagery of this long ass hand this man has like oh i did not notice that the first time oh yeah it's awesome yeah it's so good. Oh my god! Ugh. <laughs> yeah, that's it's great. Long as his body. That's the thing. You're like, where the fuck does it like connect? I don't know. It implies yeah. that the entire shawl is just a <laughs> bunch of little bony hands that are like clumped together, and they're super long. Uh, 
Then pile up all that remain to you, chant the words I sacrifice in your heart, and you shall be granted raven black wings upon which you shall soar from the summit into the heavens. Uh, and it's just, and so like that's the last thing the God Hand says to them, and Griffith has this one last moment of like reflection as he sees guts has now finally climbed to the top and he realizes that because of guts he has forgotten his dream and because of guts he lost sight of what he was going for and because of guts he is here now and because of guts i'm going to sacrifice all of you maybe there's also an angle of like oh guts you're able to climb up here this is the what your effort amounts but by me just saying yes i will rise above even that mountain that you were able to climb that could also be it too where There's... it's like i've always wanted to be above you guts and now that you've shown that you can get here i need to get out of here i'm gonna you. ascend i'm gonna go way beyond yeah. and like the look in his face is so serene and like hell yeah he's so happy like in his heart he's so clear right now like just clear-hearted just the most strong yes i feel like there's no hesitation mm -hmm. and then we have the feast which is all the bad things happening everyone gets attacked Slugman reappears. I don't think our favorite uh, seductive demon shows up until the next volume. Um, but everyone just starts to get eaten. And Griffith goes into his cocoon. And we cut to Rickon, who is now outside this giant vortex where everything is happening. And uh, the final image here about in the volume is Skull Knight and Zod. Which is interesting, after everything we've seen about Skull Knight, it's like he's showing up here to challenge Zod, not stand by his side. That's, right? This is the rawest shit, by the way. Yes. They made such similar prophecies, but then you see them at odds with each other here. So it's like, what's really going on? Um, I do want to touch a little bit on about this, and I'll probably end up repeating it as well. Um, there is a redacted retcon taken away chapter in the the eclipse that that shows god right? oh is this Rather... the time to talk about it because i have a lot to say about that chapter. yeah they revealed basically the big bad and i think uh i think mira's justification for you know kind of uncanonizing that chapter well he mm -hmm. never explicitly said that it's not canon um I think he just didn't want to release that chapter because he's like, if I show, if I show the big bad, if I show God yeah. in this chapter, I have, I have established the range that this story can reach. Yeah, I remember an interview saying that he gave too much of the themes and plot away in in God's mo monologue. Yeah. I I will say like when I first read it. <sighs> I have I have a thing where and this is a grim dark story at the end of the day so it's like it's it's going to be this way but a story where the only like the the all source of supernatural elements is negativity and evil without a counterbalancing mm -hmm. good aspect to it those kinds of stories really rub me the wrong way cuz it's like it's just so forcefully negative where it's like well humans are inherently neg like they're producing this negative energy it's like so there's just no good alternative. There's no actual, like, positive god or angels, or if there is one, it's actually a secretly evil god, like Shin Megami Tensei tends to do. It's just a preference thing that I wanted to, like, voice here, because it, it kind of annoyed me, so in one sense, I'm glad, like, the chapter gets non-canonized, but at the other side, it, like, I know that that's the core of this world now. Like, there's no taking away what I read the first time through. And you Maybe. know what? Yeah. Let me hit you with what made it better for me. Because okay. I also kind of had the same thought of like, it, with, with, within a grimdark story, that's kind of like the last blow of like, oh man, like the only godly beings in this story are evil. It's like, is that too grimdark? Here's the thing. W within the, like within the canon of that non-canonized chapter, basically the reason that God was birthed and the reason it's evil is specifically the people of the world just couldn't accept that bad things happen for no reason. The number one wish of humanity more than there for be more than there to be good in the world, more than there to be an afterlife. The number one wish of humanity was for there to be a reason yeah. bad things happen to good people. Mm -hmm. So I think essentially what happened is 
it's not necessarily that more evil came into the world. I think evil was given a personification, so that way <sighs> there is a it gets chicken and eggish though where it it's like good. where okay but where is when you pray to a miracle and you can't believe life is so good to you right now and you step and you step back and you reflect on life and it's like how did i get here in a positive way it's just, it's just like it's to me it's annoying when it's like well there's nothing for that sorry those those emotions don't go anywhere only the the negative ones that you need rat rat ratification for go somewhere. Now, mm -hmm. this ultimately, Miura crafted such a cool story that despite this being like not my jam, I still like very much love the story, and it, it just grows in my approximation as we talk yeah. about it and as I read further into the arcs. But I will just voice that as like we were talking about how the setting is not usually my cup of jam, and like that particular sticking point also always annoys me. Um, in other and those, stories, those complaints could be part of the very reasons he chose to, you know, not release release that chapter. And may, I wonder, two. I wonder when in publication they decided to remove that. I wonder if it was when the story was becoming more positive, which I hear is kind of like a thing that happens. And Mira kind of maybe changed as a person a little bit, but I, I, I don't know if I've ever read any interviews that would account for that i'm interested in that too because it, it definitely like is like after this like i jokingly said um before we set up like us talking about this like after we talk about the golden age we can talk about the things that i really like actually like about <laughs> berserk um which is not that far off from the truth because like the golden age gets talked about a lot and it's great it's a masterpiece it's a tragedy but i think what makes berserk good is what comes after the golden age like that's the important oh, yeah. part what comes after the disaster and what do you go from because I, I think and like I, the golden age is undeniably 10 out of 10 peak writing of a like i of a what like in all of human fiction the yeah. way that the golden age is constructed minus some pacing issues with like say the wild area like the overall arc is brilliant like it's next level mm -hmm. good but it's not necessarily for everyone right and, but it's it's also weird to think that like it, the point of the story is not the golden age, and I think that's that's something to harp home. Which is why like it sucks that the 1990s anime ends on the eclipse because you think that's what Berserk is about, mm -hmm. but really it's not. We've we've just now finished the backstory for this grander tale of recovery, um, and so I think that's why I think going forward after all of this is so much more interesting to look at, analyze, and kind of like discuss. Because we're now getting to what the message that Mira is trying to actually impose from the story that he was writing here. Uh, but getting back to the chapter at hand, Bradley, I kind of, I, I kind of agree with both of y'all in which y'all were discussing talking here. I agree with Willard that like it kind of sucks that they're like everything is just originated from evil and like the evil things are kind of the big overarching controlling aspects of the world with no counterbalance to it. But at the same time, I really like the the narrative of like we as humans want an excuse that is not our own as to why bad things happen. That there is some sort of outside influence that we can kind of like shut all of our sins off of and give that blame as to why these things are happening. I, I definitely think the logic and the psychology of it is very good. I will agree. Yes, I, I like Just that a like lot. Execution, and I think I, and now it, it makes me a little better because then it comes to think of it of like what brings you goodness and happiness in the world isn't some outside being it's you making an effort to find that change and to find that good in the world and that's how it's going to bring you to happiness like it took effort for guts to find the good in griffith and find the good in the band of hawk and like it took some egging on from people but i like that idea of like you have to go out in the world and find what makes you happy and that's what kind of guts was getting to in this arc was that like i am never going to find what fills me by sticking around with griffith i need to go find what makes me happy and what makes me whole on my own and and completely separate from griffith so i may be an equal and i like that i like the message of like you are responsible for your happiness and it's never too far away from you to get and recover and get again um so, but that's not why I wanted to bring up this chapter, uh, ironically. <laughs> it was a good, dis uh, I've, I've been wanting to do this discussion since we start, like, this is actually yes. what I was most looking forward to talking oh, about. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, I, it's a great discussion. Uh, mine is a much simpler approach. Like, 
Griffith is having this discussion with God, and he asks, why did you make me this way? And what do you want me to do? And he's just like, do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> Very and Griffith hedonistic. Goes, and Griffith goes, fine, but I want wings. Like, if there was anything that I would want kept from this chapter in Berserk is just that exchange. I don't need the background. I don't need anything else. But Griffith's declaring that he's going to have wings and become the hawk, become Femto, and, like, the imagery of the wings of freedom and just kind of ascending on his own, I think is such a great metaphor of, like, what he's become. Because we have that whole discussion, like, topic earlier or, like, that what they were saying before of like your band of hawk that is what got you to where you are before and Griffith come to realization that he never made it on his own and now he's given the tools to make it on his own so now he wants the wings to fly by himself um so i just really like that imagery and that metaphor that comes from that and i just and so at this point uh griffith is in his little cocoon baby egg being remade to femto and a lot of other stuff, bad stuff is going to happen that we'll discuss next time we, we get together and do this. Excellent. Um, but, like, it's a weird thing where, like, I the Golden Age kind of stops now. Like, I like right, we're at the advent, right? I, it's There's nothing great happening anymore. <laughs> <laughs> nothing um, golden. All, it's all darkness from yeah, here. Yeah, all black from here. Yeah. Um, But, like, I, I'm, I think the what Mira was building up to into this tragedy with Griffith and Guts and Casca was, was great. It was incredible. Um, I know it, it's kind of disappointing and sad. I guess not disappointing, but like, you know, when media is so powerful and like art is so powerful, it kind of radiates across like the world. So like, if you know anything about Berserk, Berserk in the golden age, you know where it's going, you know where it's heading. And so it's like, it kind of makes me sad that I never got to see this as it was coming out and got to experience it blind. But at the same time, it doesn't take away, I think from the great artistry and the great art and the character development and the themes that come from that long stretch of berserk. Like I know a bunch of assorted berserk mini spoils along the way, but I think Mura, like he just executes on them all well enough to where like it's fine. And also like, it also explains why, the people who were reading these in the 90s become so yeah. grossly, like, obsessed, like, in a positive way with the series. Where it's like, this is, people are missing out. Like, this is next level. And why, if, if you stumbled into this blind, you might go on to make a video game series heavily inspired by this. And it, it pops off. Like, it it changes you, how you view media if, like, you just stumble mm-hmm. into this without expecting it. Yeah. I just, and so... I think the Golden Age, like I said before, it's it, and how will they say it? it's like ten out of ten. It's some of the best writing that's ever been done in the history of the world. I think it's 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 great. And it, it feels unique. Like there are some things there that like you've seen before, but it feels like a whole unique story. And it feels like such a great like creative endeavor and a great like setup to what these characters are and what they have to go through. But I'm very excited to talk about what comes after. Uh, this because I think that 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 part berserk was unknown to me so I was like I don't know what the fuck happens after this and going and I thought to myself like I probably won't get as much enjoyment from golden age as I am going for the rest of berserk and I found the opposite to be true where like everything afterwards I have just enjoyed more and more and more because of how good the golden age was I feel like the steps are happening now make me like enjoy the story so much because we have so much like investment from what's happened here really excited to talk about the fairy arc with you guys because that one's obviously closer in my mind and also like i don't i i I wasn't super hot on the first half of it which is why i stopped reading there all those years ago and i I started from the beginning this time um so like yeah yeah, i'm excited for y'all's takes on a lot of those because by the end of it i saw the vision there of the, uh, the elf arc so and so i think next time um, like we gotta finish up the rest of the eclipse because I have a lot Woo! more stuff to talk about, especially oh, yeah. Skull Knight, that boy everywhere. We have to do post eclipse stuff, um, and I'll try to figure out like a good stopping point of it might be just those things to keep things clean so we can just move on to like the fairy yeah. arc and not get interrupted halfway yeah, through. Yeah, shorter one than this would be it would be nice too. <laughs> it would be nice. Like I said before, I literally thought the pacing of this was like okay, sex scene with the princess. 
get back together with Anna Hawk, Casca and Guts, save Griffith, Advent. That's Did exactly I, how I, I remember it from five years ago. Yes. Say, Wild's yes. worst crime was making this podcast longer. Wow, that's his yeah. worst crime. <laughs> it's <laughs> worst thing ever. Uh, but thank you all again. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. Um, I said six months last time, so let's go with three months. Maybe we'll we'll make yeah. it then. Uh, you're extremely welcome, Ryan. By the way. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Bye bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>